Good morning and welcome to Salford City Council's planning panel. My name is Councillor Ray Mashita and I'm Chair of Salford Planning Panel. Given the pandemic, only elected members need to be physically present in meetings to make decisions and so officers of the council can join meetings remotely. The planning officers presenting items today uh, to this agenda are doing so remotely. Uh, there are three officers in the room. Uh, there's, uh, there's Mr Hodgson who's uh, lead, on, lead on the development management side. Uh, there's Mr... Mr Shuttleworth, that's, that's my second meeting, I do apologise. We have Mr Shuttleworth who's lead on the policy of the council planning policy side. And there is Miss Edwards who's the clerk of our panel. Thank you. Okay, they will be giving uh, advice to the panel as well, but in, in person. Uh, this meeting will also be streamed live, as you just saw the start, as, as you just did. Uh, if you do intend to film a photo, photo of the meeting, can you do so in such a manner as to, uh, to not to, to disturb other members of the public from speaking freely? Thank you. Uh, further, my last request of your good selves is could you please respect the COVID safe protocols that are inside this building? Thank you so much. Okay, first, over to the order of business. The first application is proposed for refusal from officer's recommendation. Uh, when that's the case, then the, or, the running order changes. Uh, so the running order for the first application will be the, the officers will present the application. After then, I'll be asking the applicants of the applicants or any uh, of, of the application. Third, I'll be asking any objectors who, who, uh, who, uh, to speak. And fourth, I'll be asking any ward councillors present to speak or any MPs, representatives, etc. Uh, I'll allow uh, 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 10 minutes for both sides. Uh, if there's one speaker, you get 10 minutes. If there's two speakers, it's five minutes. If there are three speakers, then, uh, which I believe there is for this application this morning, the first application. So I'm not going to divide 10 by 3 and end up with 3 minutes 20. I think we'll end up with 3 minutes 30 each. Is that okay? So, uh, so I think that's a better way of doing it. After then, uh, ward councillors will get five minutes each to speak. Is that okay? Following that, I'll close from your good selves and open up the debate with the members of the panel. Uh, during that time, uh, we will, uh, look, uh, oh, if there's a question that we just don't know the answer to, we'll bring you very quickly in for a factual answer, then we'll close and back into the debate. Uh, then we'll move to a decision made on material planning grounds. Those material planning grounds are government and council uh, planning policies. Uh, during that time, if there's a motion contrary to the officer's recommendation, then before any vote is taken, a senior officer will be asked to advise the panel of the merits of that motion. Following that, we'll move to a vote on the, those material planning grounds. Uh, everyone will vote at the same time, and in case of a tie, either chair will have a further a vote to decide the application. I hope that's clear. Ladies and gentlemen, decisions were made today. Those decisions may or may not please everybody, but I'd like to feel that throughout the whole of the proceedings that you had a fair and uh, well, you have a fair and equal hearing throughout the whole of the proceedings. Thank you. Okay, members, are you happy to include parts one and two of the agenda? Thank you. Uh, is there any apologies for absence? Yes, Chair. Apologies from Councillors Birch, Dickman and Linda. And Councillor Garrido, I believe, is going to be late. No, thank you. OK, uh, um, just for members of the public or anyone watching on the live stream, could we just, uh, would you just read out a roll call, Ms Edwards, or who's present, which members are? So the members present are Councillors Bob Clark, Phil Cusack, Jim Darson, Jane Hamilton, Mike McCusker, Margaret Morris, Neil Reynolds, Peter Taylor, Phil Tresider, John Warmisham, and yourself, Chair. I believe that's 11 members. It is, yes. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. Okay, members, uh, I've asked you, are you happy to include parts one and two? Are you any declarations of interest, members? No? Okay, are you happy to approve the minutes from the previous meeting on the 2nd of this September? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, uh, should we move on to planning applications? Item 5A. Uh, this is uh, North, on 11 Northumberland Street. Uh, I believe the presenting officer is Miss Stewart. Miss Stewart, can you hear yourself? Yes, good morning, Chair. No, could you go forward a slide and back a slide? Yep, that seemed to be, seemed, it seemed to work for us. Maybe, maybe a bit of a delay for your good self. Mr. Williams, is it possible we could have the screen maximised so we could see Ms. Stewart? Thank you so much. OK, Ms. Stewart, uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much. OK, thank you. Uh, just before we start, as you've probably just, just noted, um, I do sometimes experience a delay when moving through the slide. Um, so I'll just allow for a short pause in between slides to make sure the presentation is caught up before I begin to speak. Uh, 
Uh, this application relates to a site at 11 Northumberland Street and seeks permission for the demolition of the existing entrance lobby and erection of a single-storey side and rear extension to the existing synagogue, creation of a surface car park and alterations to the roof and elevations of the existing single-storey side extension. So this slide shows the application site outlined in red and the site accommodates the existing synagogue building to the front and a bowling green to the rear. To the east are residential properties and to the west is the school. Here are some site photos showing the front and side elevations of the existing building. And a couple more site photos of the rear elevation and the current condition of the bowling green to the rear. Here is a proposed site plan which indicates the proposed extension to the existing building here and the proposed surface car park here to the rear over the existing bowling green. So for comparison, here is the existing and proposed floor plan. The proposed extension is shown here and would accommodate the mikvah and associated changing area, toilets, etc. These next couple of slides show the proposed elevations alongside the existing elevations. So at the top, we've got the existing and proposed front elevations showing the change to the roof and the fenestration of the existing extension. Um, and at the bottom, we've got the existing and proposed rear elevations where you can see the proposed new extension here and the roof of the, um, the alter alterated roof to the existing extension in the background. Similarly, we've got here the existing and proposed side extension, side elevations. So to the left hand side to the school, we've got the extension visible here, but set back. Um, and to the right hand side from the access road and car park, um, we've got the proposed extension here and the new roof and alterations to the fenestration of the existing extension. Members, you'll be aware from the panel report that there are no significant issues with regards to the proposed extension and car park itself. However, there's an in principle objection to the loss of the bowling green and extensive site history relating to this, which is set out in the panel report, but which I'll also discuss now over the coming slides. So this slide shows the first application for the site from back in 2011. The proposed site plan is shown here, as well as some photos taken from the time of the application. The application related to the change of use of the building and some small additions, but was not acceptable as insufficient information was provided in relation to trees and also in relation to UDP policy R1, which relates to the protection of recreational land and facilities, having regard to the fact that the bowling green operate independently from the building. Therefore, the change of use of the building, if omitted, would have also seen the loss of the bowling green. The applicants were made aware Ms. Stewart, the time I'm sorry of the recreational use Ms. Stewart, submitted for Ms. consideration Ms. by the City Council Ms. Stewart, in order to justify the loss. Ms Stewart, could you, could you go back 30 seconds? Unfortunately, the, the connection muffled and so we, we, you, you weren't clear at all. So could, you go back, could you go back to the beginning of the, of the previous slide and start from the... Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Um, so this, this one, the, uh, the proposed and existing side elevations. Yeah, yeah, please start from there again. Yeah, just, yeah, because yeah, you, you no, got muffled no just problem. between the two slides and it, it, it's unfortunate the, the Wi-Fi is sadly, so. Yeah, no problem, that's fine. Um, so here we have the existing uh, and proposed side elevations. So we've got the proposed left side elevation um, adjacent to the school with the proposed extension visible here, but set back. Um, and the proposed right-hand side elevation to the access road and car park with the proposed new extension here and the alterations to the roof and the fenestration here. Members, as you will be aware from the panel report, there are no significant issues with regards to the proposed extension and car park itself. However, there's an in-principle objection to the loss of the bowling green and extensive site history relating to this, which is set out in the panel report and which I'll also cover over the coming slides. So this slide shows the first application for the site from back in 2011. 
A proposed site plan is shown here as well as some photos from the time of the application. This application related to the change of use of the building and some small additions, but was not acceptable as insufficient information was provided in relation to trees and also in relation to UDP policy R1, which relates to the protection of recreational land and facilities, having regard to the fact that the bowling green couldn't operate independently from the building and therefore, if permitted, the change of use of the building would have also seen the loss of the bowling green. The applicants were made aware that an assessment of the recreational use should be submitted for consideration in order to justify the bowling green in relation to the points set out in policy R1. Alongside this, it was advised that if it could be demonstrated that the site was surplus to use as a bowling green, it was unlikely that the site would be surplus to all recreational needs and therefore for the principle of development to be acceptable from a recreation policy perspective, Replacement provision was required either by way of a physical replacement or financial contribution to enhance existing recreation facilities locally. The application was subsequently withdrawn by the agent with a view to resubmitting with supporting information to address the issues raised. A further application was submitted later in 2011, which was a resubmission of the previous withdrawn application. The resubmission, as with the withdrawn application, proposed the change of use of the building, but also now included a detached pavilion building, which can be seen here, to ensure that the building green, the bowling green could continue to operate independently following the change of use of the existing building. The approved plaques site plan for this application is shown here and clearly indicates the retained bowling green to the rear of the site as well as the pavilion building to the eastern side of the site. This application was submitted uh, and approved subject to conditions. The synagogue use was implemented under this permission but the extensions were not implemented. Subsequent applications for extensions to the building have shown that the bowling green and pavilion building um, would be unaffected and saw extensions to the building only and as such the use of the building and Bowling Green continues to operate under this 2011 permission. The use is in breach of conditions 4, 5 and 7 of the permission which are set out here which required the pavilion building as shown on the submitted plans to be provided um, required the submission of a management and maintenance plan for the Bowling Green and pavilion building and also replacement trees. The pavilion building has not been implemented on site and a management plan was submitted and approved in 2013 but was never implemented on site. Amongst other things, this management plan um, that was agreed set out that the landlord accepted full responsibility to ensure that the bowling green and pavilion were maintained to a good standard prior to it being leased out and in a subsequent period where the site was not being made that fit for green and it also was out that the site would be marketed in the press and also with local estate agents. Miss Stewart, <coughs> Miss Stewart. Yep. Yeah, you, you need to go back two paragraphs. I'm afraid it cuts up again. Oh, sorry. There's a real we, we, delay we you, as well as my, for... my slides. Yeah, we heard you loud and clear for that slide. For, 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 it was just go back two paragraphs on the previous slide. That's it. So, just two paragraphs on that slide. The last two paragraphs you didn't catch it. In relation to the conditions. Uh, yes, I believe so. When you were getting down five and seven, it, it was breaking up when you were talking about five and seven. Okay. Um, just work out there. Okay, so. So uh, the use um, that was implemented under the 2011 permission um, is in breach of conditions 4, 5 and 7 of that permission, which required the pavilion building to be provided um, and required the submission of a management and maintenance plan for the bowling green and pavilion and also uh, replacement trees to be provided on site. The pavilion building has not been provided on site and whilst the management plan was submitted and approved in 2013. This has not been implemented on site. The management plan that was agreed set out that the landlord accepted full responsibility to ensure that the bowling green and pavilion were maintained to a good standard prior to it being leased out 
uh, and that in any subsequent period when the site was not leased out, the landlord was to ensure that it was maintained to a level deemed fit for a bowling green. And it also set out that the site would be marketed in the press and with local estate agents. So in 2013, a further application was submitted, which proposed extensions to the building. The approved site plan is shown here as well. Um, again, there's some photos from the time of the application. Again, this application indicated the retention of the bowling green and pavilion building, albeit with the pavilion building in a slightly different position. The approved site plan um, is shown here also indicated the tree planting as required by the previous permission. Um, it's understood that demolition took place um, under this application for elements down this side of the, the site, but that the extensions were not implemented. A subsequent application was then submitted later in 2013, which proposed an extension to the building. This is the approved site plan and a photo from the time of the officer's site visit. Again, this application included the retention of the bowling green and pavilion building, and also indicated the tree planting required by the previous permissions, which was again carried over as a condition of this permission. The application was permitted subject to conditions and has been implemented on site. The development carried out under this late 2013 permission is in breach of conditions 3, 5, 7 and 8, which are shown on the screen there, and required the provision of a safe pedestrian route to the western side of the building, replacement trees as indicated on the submitted plans, samples and details of materials uh, for approval of the local planning authority and details of the proposed front door. Notwithstanding the breach of these conditions, a site visit was carried out in 2019 to review the works that had been carried out on site in breach of the conditions. Um, and in relation to three, seven and eight, um, which related to the safe pedestrian route, the materials and the front door, it was considered that the works carried out on site, whilst not um, first being discharged, were acceptable and therefore no enforcement action um, is proposed in relation to, to those conditions. But condition five, which related to the replacement trees, is still outstanding. In 2015, a further application was submitted, um, which indicated the loss of the bowling green for additional car parking spaces. The proposed site plan is shown here. Um, again, during the course of this application, the case officer advised that conditions attached to previous consents had not been complied with and that the application needed to be supported by an assessment of recreational use in relation to the proposed loss of the bowling green. The 2015 application was withdrawn with the agent confirming that they would be looking to submit an application to remove the planning conditions relating to the bowling green attached to earlier consents. No further applications to develop the site or to remove or vary any of the conditions attached to previous permissions have been submitted until the submission of this current application. This current application was submitted in 2018 and here are some photos of the site over recent years which shows the deterioration of the bowling green from 2011 to present in breach of the management plan that was submitted and agreed. As can be seen from the report and this presentation, the history of the site is extensive and dates back to 2011. The position has always been clear that the protection of the bowling green is paramount and that its redevelopment would not be supported unless it can be demonstrated that the site is surplus to all recreational needs, an alternative provision is made or financial mitigation is provided. As a 
very strong policy protection Ms. Ms. for recreational land and resources to my bikes into the lowest. Could you could you start this slide again, yeah. please? Could you start this slide again? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, so, as can be seen from the report and this presentation, history of the site is extensive, dating back to 2011, and the position has always been clear that the protection of the bowling green is paramount and that its redevelopment would not be supported unless it can be demonstrated that the site is surplus to all recreational needs and alternative provision is made or financial mitigation is provided. <clears throat> There's a very strong policy protection for recreational land and resources which sets a high bar in terms of allowing such spaces to be developed and this is a consistent approach applied to sites such as this across the city. <clears throat> the withdrawal of the initial 2011 application and its resubmission supported by measures proposed by the applicant to ensure the retention and continued availability of the bowling green sets out a clear acceptance and commitment from the applicants to safeguard the bowling green which is continued to automate approvals. Such measures have been secured through conditions attached to previous planning approvals and if these conditions would not have been attached then the development of the site would not have been supported and the position has been made clear. Despite this commitment there's been some serious breaches of planning control over a number of years and the responsibility to retain, manage and maintain the area have been disregarded and the area allowed to fall into disrepair. It's also noted that the replacement tree that was provided following the unauthorised felling of a TPO tree is now no longer in place. The applicants cannot demonstrate that the site is surplus, have not put forward any alternative provision for consideration and are now no longer agreeable to the mitigation payment that was previously agreed following a lengthy period of negotiation with the local planning authority which is set out in the panel report. The breaches of conditions discussed throughout the report and in this presentation were intended to be dealt with by the positive determination of this current application which was previously recommended for approval subject to conditions with the delegated report signed and awaiting the signing of the 106 agreement in relation to the mitigation payment for the loss of the bowling green. <coughs> As the applicants are no longer agreeable to the mitigation payment, the principle of redevelopment is unacceptable and it therefore recommended that the application be refused for the reasons set out in the officer report and that enforcement action is taken in relation to the breach of conditions on the 2011 and 2013 applications together with the removal of the replacement tree that mitigated for the loss of the tree. TPO tree that was felled unlawfully and also in relation to the erection of the wooden extension, a mobile building more recently erected on site without the benefit of planning permission. Thank you Chair, apologies for the connection issue. Thank you Ms Stewart, uh, we got there in the end, thank you, thank you so much. Okay, uh, moving over to the applicants and the uh, supporters of the application side. I've got three speakers. I've got Mr. Yoke Tua, uh, Mr. Rothbart, and Mr. Thompson. Uh, who's going first? Sir, please come forward. Please come forward. Uh, uh, the, uh, we'll, uh, Helen, would you switch on the microphone? Would you be so kind? Thank you. So if we could just know your name and where you reside, the only reason why I ask where you reside, it just helps with context of your submission to the panel so we can better understand your, your, your point of view. Is that okay? Please take your seats, please. Thank you. Right. Uh, so if we could have your name, please. Moisha Rothbart. Rothbart. Okay, Mr. Rothbart, uh, you have three and a half minutes to speak. Is, it, is that okay? I think there were two speakers, I'm having five minutes each. Uh, as far as I understood, there's, there was, uh, there's a section of ten minutes to, uh, for both sides, and uh, there's, I've got three people registered to speak. Uh, I've got a Ms. Young Tua, a Mr. Rothbart, uh, and a Mr. Thompson. No, I think there are only two. There's only two speakers. Okay. It's okay. Uh, so, okay. You, you know what? Um, five minutes each. How about that? Is that okay? And we'll get we'll get everybody in. Thanks so, very is, much. That, is that all right? It's, it's just, 
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rockwell, whenever you're ready, please get started. I'll give you a shout at four minutes to help time your good self. Is that okay? That's right. Good morning, everybody. May I please take this opportunity to briefly introduce myself. My name is Moishe Rothbard, born and bred in Salford. We're here to discuss the planning application that has just been addressed at length regarding the community centre at 11 Northumberland Street. To add an additional single-storey extension to its existing facilities, which will hopefully house a spiritual ritual bathing facility and its reference on today's agenda as item 5A. Whilst I'm not looking to take up your time with unnecessary details of our religion, I ask you to kindly spare me a very short minute to explain the tradition and importance of spiritual ritual bathing as part of our overall daily religion. Mikveh, the name we call the ritual bath, dates back to the times of the Babylonian and appeared at the beginning of the first century BCE. From then on, mikvahs were built. In October 2020, a 2,000 year old mikveh was discovered near Hanaton in northern Israel. Mikvahs are used daily for religious, spiritual purity purposes, before prayers, and whenever any significant milestone is achieved in one's life. As an example, ahead of an anticipated birth, ahead of a bar mitzvah, meaning when children transition on to adulthood, or ahead of a wedding, or before any Jewish holiday. The synagogue itself serves as a fully-fledged, independent community and centre, offering a variety of services and benefits to its 120 congregants, members and their families. In addition, we also provide for many non-member families that depend on its services. It is also responsible for schooling the children of these families and has independent private boys and girls schools located locally educating close to 700 children in total. The synagogue also runs an equivalent to a food bank for the poor and voucher schemes which assist in clothing for the children of the less fortunate families. When COVID was raging, they played such a key role in providing a variety of services by teams of volunteers, which included medical, practical and emotional support. In my personal capacity, being a volunteer and heading and being responsible for the local burial society, which represents almost 2,500 local Jewish families. I confidently state, in the absence of these volunteers, we would never have managed the challenges presented to us. Day and night, this community provided the resources that were tragically needed so desperately during that period. Their understanding of belonging to society at large is what drives them. Their understanding of responsibility to the wider community runs through their veins. And finally, their appreciation by the community at large is difficult to describe in the five minutes I've been awarded to speak. Equally, I'd say, we have also watched the local authority in a very calculated manner step up to their responsibility and cater for the less fortunate. And today we are able to walk the streets of Salford in a healthy and safe environment with a series of new developments catering for the diverse community that Salford is so well known for. Certainly something which it is to be proud of. Throughout my life, apart from five years which I spent studying abroad and getting married to my wife of 29 years in New York, my time has been spent entirely in Salford. When I moved back from New York in 1997, Salford was not the Salford we know it today. It was riddled with challenges, all of which the local authority ably tackled, took in hand, and delivered a Salford the way we know it today, a Salford of 2021. Have a minute left, sir. A Salford where its streets are safe, a Salford where education is fully met, a Salford where the ethnic minority are welcome and appreciated, and happy and glad to call it their home. I clearly recall the lush green fields dotted around the city of Salford, and we fully appreciate the tough decision the local authority was compelled to make when they converted this into housing. Despite the objections many locals made at the time, the local authority 
clearly understood its responsibilities and gained the support it needed to convert it to housing, which is so desperately required. We view this as a partnership. More than we have given to Salford, Salford is giving us. But equally, we will continue to give as much as we are able to. Against this backdrop, where we stand today with this subject application, we once again need to shoulder the responsibility and provide for a facility that the community so desperately requires and is relying on. This is something we need to do jointly as a society. This facility will come at a cost, but will be covered by charitable donations. I finish by saying, thanks for listening, and I'm sure you'll see and recognize the justification of us requesting this, that this application is granted without the charities and community being further burdened with this additional cost. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Lockhart. Thank you. Okay, uh, just before the next person, Helen's just going to clean the, uh, clean the chair and the table, etc. Okay. Okay, uh, who's next? Thompson? Right, thank you. Yeah. Thompson, uh, well, I know your name. Uh, if you uh, tell us where you're from, uh, it helps with the context of your of course, submission. Yeah, of of course. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Matt Thompson. I'm head teacher at Brentnall Community Primary School, which is a community school located just to the west of the site uh, where the application um, has been made. And um, just like my, my fellow colleague there, uh, I too am sort of born in Red Group. You've got five minutes. Oh, sorry, I'll give you a, <laughs> No, no, so you've got five minutes. I'll give you a shout. I won't need four. five minutes. Thomas Thompson, I wish you good stuff. Thank you. Um, so yeah, just like my fellow colleague, as I was saying, I'm um, just off of born and bred. Grew up in Broughton, so um, you know, have a very keen interest uh, in the local community. Um, so as a school, we are very much not opposed to the application um, and can actually see the benefits for the local community. Um, and my reason for attending this morning. Um, is really to, to highlight some of the concerns we have got regarding this site, um, if, if that's okay. So obviously my main priority as a teacher is around the health and safety and safeguarding of our 254 children that we have um, in, our, in our school. Um, and so some of the concerns that we've got, the, the main one is around one of the trees that is currently on the site, which is the reason why I've been asked to attend this morning. Um, so we have had now two tree reports um, one of which um, was back in 2018 and one um, just on the 6th of September this year regarding uh, a live poplar tree um, which originally in the original report was weak and required 50% removal but this one, um, this latest report on the 6th of September um, by our tree surgeon says that it requires full removal due to a significant inclusion at the base of the tree so it's whether this could be tied as part of, part of this um, uh, and, and that's part of, part of obviously our concern. Um, the, other, the other things that, that we have concerns around are um, part of the school fence was removed last time um, in order to allow for the extension to be completed, which was just prior to me starting as head teacher at the school back in 2014. However, um, I believe to a 20 week um, removal, but actually it took um, over 18 months for that fence to be put back, which was a school actually replacing that fence and then having to, um, to, to sort of seek the cost back from from this, uh, the, the people at the synagogue. Um, since then, we've also got a new um, unit for special needs children, which serves 13 children with um, an autistic spectrum disorder at the school, so that obviously heightens the risk. Um, so should any sort of fencing or they be, uh, you know, be busier um, during the, the um, process of, of the build being completed, obviously that, that, that does pose a significant risk to our children. Um, however, we can obviously see the benefits um, to, to the, the, the site because the parking and driving on Northumberland Street itself is incredibly busy. We have had several occasions where we've had children nearly knocked down. Um, we haven't at the moment got um, a lollipop man, unfortunately, at the start and end of the day. He retired back in July and that hasn't been replaced yet. So we do have significant concerns um, regarding the number of cars on, on, on the road. Um, but yes, yeah, so that was our uh, that was main concern. There have been uh, letters sent from the school by our legal department uh, back on the 12th of the 3rd, 2018 and the 13th of the 6th, 18. Um, regarding the trees, um, but to date we've had no response uh, regarding that. So, that was pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Helen. Miss you, Mr. Your turn. Thank you.
I'm sure to, uh, if we could just find out where you reside, it just helps with context for the panel. Uh, you've, you've got your five minutes, I'll give you a shout at the floor. Is, is that okay? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Hope it's a good Hi, good morning, uh, Chair, Councillors. My name is Plami. I represent the architecture as the agent for this application this morning. I'd like to start with a very brief planning background. Uh, the site was a conservative social club, and more than 10 years ago, it was evident that there is no local demand for that facility anymore, and it was converted into a synagogue. The application in front of you today is for a single-story extension to house the religious worship facilities and for a more efficient site layout. It was reiterated many times before in communications with the planning officers, in the officer's report in front of you, and in the earlier presentation today, that the application itself abides by all planning guidance. It abides by the planning principles in terms of design and access, it will make the site better aesthetically and the wider area. As it was just mentioned by uh, the school representative and through a formal letter of representation, uh, it will make the street safer for everyone. Uh, there is also a letter of support from the local community of more than 200 signatures and there isn't a single objection to this. So the reason why we're here today is that the application has been recommended for refusal solely based on the fact that the applicant does not agree to a Section 106 monetary contribution. I appreciate that viability is usually used in residential development when a uh, house, housing uh, contractor claims that let's say 20% profit is just simply not enough to give us affordable housing, but this case it's not viable because the applicant is a charity organization. Every contribution that the applicant agrees to will be taken directly from the charitable donations of the local community. It is simply not viable, especially nowadays with their budget already stretched after the significant help they've offered the local community in the past year. It will render the building of that extension impossible. The application will just simply not happen. Uh, the land will stay vacant and the local community will suffer. So while we really appreciate the help of the planning department and the significant collaborative spirit that they've shown in the past very long uh, planning process, we're here today to ask you councillors to vote against the recommendation for refusal, to support that application and let the local community make the most efficient use of their asset. Thank you and let me know if you have any further questions. Thank you, Ms. Shilter. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, I'm going to... Close to that section. Uh, are there any any other speakers? No, no one for registered. I've got two ward councils next. Uh, before I bring you forward, uh, Councillor Wright, uh, I just need to make sure we've wiped down the table and the chair. Is that okay? Uh, Helen, please, please, you don't need to run. Just, just take your time. Don't worry. It's okay. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, I'm here today as a ward councillor, having been involved and supported my residents for almost three years on this application. Um, as, as we've heard, um, the, since opening their doors, this synagogue and community centre has served the local community, has served my residents on a, on a range of uh, uh, um, groups and events, social events, and the needs of the community of the of my residents are growing and they wish to therefore extend their premises and expand their services. There's so much more we can do, there's so much more to be done, which is why they want to extend the premises. This property, which is currently known as the Bowling Green, has a very rich heritage since at least the uh, um, 1830s and 40s has been used up until recently when it was a conservative club and a Bowling Green has been used for a range of community events for, for, for community matters, but always changing with the needs of the community. It never stayed for one specific use because it kept changing to make sure that it was in line with the requirements of the local residents. Right now, what the local community needs is the expansion of this premises. As we've heard, we need parking, both for the safety of the street, there's a school next door, 
It will make the entire area safer, and particularly us as a council, we try and promote cycling and walking, and the off-road parking will make the entire street and the whole area better, as well as giving the community centre the opportunity to, to, to supply um, um, disabled parking, uh, um, um, charging points for cars, which currently, which currently cannot be done. I wish to address the term of loss of Bowling Green, which, which we've heard a lot about today. Over the three years which I've been involved, there's been three points which have baffled me. Um, the first one is, what exactly is the demand for bowling in the local area? Now, no disrespect to anybody who enjoys bowling, but there isn't much demand locally. I've asked officers to produce proof that there is a demand, and in the over decade that this synagogue has been there, nobody yet has knocked on the door and said, please can I pay all. Number two is the fact this is a private band and it's owned privately. In the past, it was a private members club, and it wasn't open to the public. And today, they could, even if somebody did want to come and play bowling, it still is a piece of private land. As such, I'm baffled at how the calculation of £145,000 comes, come, uh, comes to be. Now, I understand the report states that this is the cost of what it will cost to lay or to buy such a bowling green. However, the cost, the use of the land, the value of the land, is nowhere near, is nowhere near that amount. And let us also bear in mind that these are funds which are coming straight out of a charity-based community organisation. In 2019, I was stuck in this conundrum. I'd met with the then Chief Executive um, um, Jim. I'd met with Miranda Watts. And we were stuck in this conundrum between a community asset, which the community wanted to make use of, but on the other hand, it was locked and restricted to be used as a community asset, a bowling green. And I tried everything and I wrote to the uh, Minister for Housing, Esther McVeigh, in 2019 to ask her for her advice and her help. And I just want to, um, I'm not going to read the entire email, I just want to read you a sentence of what she wrote. I should point out that the listing and delisting of assets of community value is a matter for the local authority. I'm here today to represent my residents. This community asset has now become a community liability. It's their liability to keep it up to the state of a bowling green, which unfortunately isn't needed. Money, funds, which could be used and channeled straight back in to the community. I think we've all seen over the last 18 months how much we need social events and groups and getting out. Any parent will tell you how difficult it is to get children and teenagers off their phones, off social media, and to get out there and get some exercise outdoors. In one of the pictures on the slides we've just viewed, minute left, Councillor. Thank you. We saw images of children kicking a ball and running around on the green. Is this council seriously going to stop children and teenagers getting out there and, you know, using a piece of Greenland and getting fresh air? Are we going to stop a community? Uh, from extending and expanding their services just because of a listing which is so outdated nobody can even find when it was listed. I'm here today on behalf of my constituents and I'm asking you panel, it lies in your hands and we're looking towards you, please return this community asset to the community. Thank you. Thank you Councillor, thank you so much. I've not forgotten your council at all, is it? I just can't invite you to the table until it's wiped down. Okay. Thank you, Helen. Council Saunders, you're up next. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I won't be needing the five minutes. I just want to say that I fully endorse my colleague, Councillor Leitner who has been involved uh, with the applicants uh, far more than I have been. So I just want to say that I fully endorse everything that he said. I'm not going to repeat it, just to point out that effectively what he said was on behalf of me as well. I just want to point out a couple of other things. Um, when the uh, club closed down and the synagogue was built in 2011, it was actually a bittersweet moment for me, because sweet that there was a new synagogue being built, but bitter because it was actually a conservative club that was closing down. Uh, however, I put it down rather than the fact there were no 
Conservatives there. I put it down to the fact that the local Conservatives were no longer drinking in the quantities they did. So as I said, it was a bittersweet moment, but now it's a wonderful community asset, as we've heard. I just want to point out two other things. One, one of the breaches mentioned was the erection of a hut at the back. It was one of the last things you saw. I'd like to point out that is actually what we call a sukkah, a little boo, the hut that is used for just over a week uh, during the Jewish Festival of Tabernacles, which has actually just taken place now. Uh, and that is taken down, particularly given the weather that we usually have in this country, that is taken down immediately after the Tabernacles Festival. The final thing I want to say, we heard from Mr Rothbard about what a mikvah is. I have to tell you that despite my disabilities, which you know, very visible. Uh, three times over the recent Jewish festivals, uh, I used a mikvah, um, despite the pain and discomfort that I was in, because of the, you know, the importance that I attached to that ritual. So I'd just like to say, join my colleague in supporting the application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Thank you so much. Thanks, Helen. Would you turn off the microphone? Are you finished? Will that be okay? Thank you so much. Okay, members. Uh, that's. Uh, thank you so much, so much for your submissions. I'm sure they'll be taken into account during the debate. Uh, members, uh, over to you yourselves. Who's going first? About Council Warsham. Anybody else? Uh, Council Kuska. Council Kuzak. Council Park. Okay. Council Warsham. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Um, as a resident of Northumberland Street, um very torn between approval and refusal on, the, on this uh, application. Certainly, I, I remember it obviously as a, a Conservative club, uh, and honestly it wasn't me that plastered it in vote Labour stickers. Um, I do know the good work that has been taking place there as a, a synagogue and as a community centre. Uh, and obviously during COVID, the amount of work that, that the community did do there, uh, I don't think people realise the amount of hidden poverty within the Jewish community in Curzon and Broughton Park. So a, a sense like this is vital for that community. We're also desperate on Northumberland Street for car parking. It is just an absolute nightmare. Uh, I think we've got either two or three synagogues, we've got the health centre, we've got the Jewish Shore Start Centre, and there's, there's just cars parked both sides, and at times, emergency vehicles can't get down, so it's very difficult. So, to be honest, the car park is much needed. Uh, if it was me, I'd actually build a multi-storey car park at the back there to try and get the cars off Northumberland Street. Uh, I think also, Chair, well, I've got the head of Brentwell here. You need to do something about your parents' parking as well. I'm sure you've tried. I'm sure you've tried, but at, the, at school time, it's a nightmare. Um, I think on the downside, one of my worries is that if we do have a, a larger car park there, are the cars going to start backing up to try and get in the car park? Um, because it's right just past the junction off Berry New Road, so it does cause problems. And also Rigby Street, which I think we've discussed at planning here before, that is a real issue as well from Rigby Street from the uh, health centre. The other thing that, that I, I am disappointed that the planning conditions and mitigation haven't been adhered to, but as Council Lightness said, you know, this is a charity uh, and, and it, it's a lot of money. And I also agree that the bowls hasn't been played there for a long time. At one time in, in Manly Park, which is just at the end of Northumberland Street, there were two fantastic bowling greens that were continually used, but they're not used anymore. Um, bowls within that area seems to have died out. So as I've said, if, um, I am torn, uh, and I'll hear what other colleagues have got to say before I, I make my decision. So thanks for that, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Walsh. Thank you. Okay, I've got Councillor McCusker, Councillor Cusack and Councillor Clark. Is there any other members? No, Councillor McCusker. Thanks, Chair. Um, 
Yeah, we've heard today about the great work that the, uh, the synagogue does and, and, and the efforts they've made to support their community um, throughout the pandemic um, and, and for a long period of time. Um, and we can understand the importance of the facility in terms of uh, Jewish people being able to properly um, celebrate their religion. So I don't think that, con you know, the, nothing about the planning application concerns me other than um, the long history of failing to meet planning conditions. Um, I recognise this as a charity, however, it, I think in not refusing this application, um, it would be setting a dangerous precedent whereby an, an organisation, company or charity makes a commitment to maintain a piece of, um, of uh, recreation space, then doesn't do that, so the recreation space gets worse and worse and worse, and then says, oh, this is the right mess. It's no longer recreation space. Um, I want to build on it, I want to put a car park on it. Um, and I, so I think that sends up a dangerous precedent if we were not to refuse this. Um, I recognise it is a large sum of money. However, since 2011, uh, the organisation has been made aware of the, the, the um, responsibility towards that recreation land and facilities. Um, I just don't think we could just let a period of time run and then say it doesn't matter. You know, if it mattered in 2011, when, as we've seen from the pictures, the facility was in good condition, um, we shouldn't reward. We shouldn't be seen to be rewarding that. Too. Thank you, Councillor McCusker. I've got Councillor Cusack and then I've got Councillor Clark. Is there any of the members? No. Okay, Councillor Cusack. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, um, I endorse what Councillor McCusker uh, has just said. I, I understand the community benefits. I sympathise absolutely um, with the, um, the religious requirements for this building. Um, it, it, in, if this were a, um, a blank slate, or a clean sheet of paper, uh, I could, could not see um, any, any real objections. However, it seems to me to be perverse of us to grant a planning application in face of the breaches of conditions that have already occurred on this site. And I have a question for the, um, for the officers uh, in this case, and that is, um, if we um, overturn the, the um, officer's recommendation and grant this permission where do we stand with the previous breaches of condition because the implication is if we grant this position those previous breaches no longer stand do we have to at some stage overturn those previous breaches or those previous conditions in order to grant this planning application chair Miss Stewart, uh, did you catch Councillor Kuzak there? Yeah, can you hear me, Chair? Yes, I can hear you. So if, um, if this application um, was overturned and approved, then a number of the conditions um, would, would fall away. Um, some in relation to sort of a replacement of the of the trees could still probably be provided, albeit that would have to be in a different format, um, given that the car park would, would cover the area and um, where some of the replacement trees, but certainly those conditions in relation to the um, provision of the pavilion building, the management and maintenance, etc., would would fall away if the new permission was approved and implemented. Thank you, Chair. Um, it, it, still, it still leaves the, permission, uh, the, 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 the question of the outstanding breach uh, of planned permission in relation to the, um, to the tree and uh, I wonder what enforcement action will be taken and whether we are still in a position to grant this application given that even if we do grant it, there is still an outstanding breach of planning permission. Mr Stewart, did, did you pick up the question? We, if yeah, if, if approved, we would look to, to put on um, a new condition um, in, relation, in relation to, to tree planting 
Um, and then in which case we, we would deal with that through um, a discharge of condition where the applicants would need to come to us to confirm sort of where the replacement trees will go, the species and, and all of those details. Um, and we deal with it through the new consent. Thank you, Chair. OK, well, Councillor Clark next. Anybody else? Councillor Hamilton, Councillor Morris. Councillor Clark. Yeah, um, a couple of things that disturb me. The amount of uh, Section 106 that they're asking for is horrific compared to, you know, some of the things we put in by tower blocks. I would expect if there was a, a need for a bowling green, we'd have somebody from the Crown Green Bowling Association here this morning moaning that they're taking a a bowling green. There's nobody complaining that there's no bowling green, so I don't think that stands up. Uh, I think we need to draw a line under it. I think, I think Adele's just said that if we did approve it, we should address the breaches that have gone on before. But I'd also like to know is what the council planning have done to address the constant breaches in the past 10 years to try and rectify this situation, because it doesn't read really well. It's a, like a, a bad school report, uh, and both sides need to, like, lift the game or make sure these things don't happen. So I agree with what John, what John said. On my, my view is that this should, we should approve this, draw a line under it and uh, try and move on. It's a charitable organisation. They do good, good work um, and we need to draw a line under this now. The, uh, the, the, the cost to uh, mitigate against the loss of the uh, community assets uh, in recreational terms is set by government policy. So it's better set through Sport England and through through that. So so it's it's not a it's it's actually a piece of legislation. So it's not uh, it's not the city that sets that. It's government that's there and that's uh, and that, that's defined in law. So it needs to be there. And if we're usually as an authority, if we're asked to go against uh, the uh, the 106 request, then there is a there is a, a viability statement submitted, uh, and it, you know it. it, it uh, the authority needs to be cautious here if it wants to override its one of what is essentially a, a mitigation request as a piece of legislation. It needs to be careful if it's just going to forego that with no genuine good reason to do so. And, that, and them reasons need to be uh, put through either a viability statement or, or from what we've heard today. But this is, a, this is considered to be a, a recreational site that needs, and it, the loss of it needs, should be mitigated uh, and as we need to weigh up. So, uh, Councillor Morris, sorry, we've got Councillor Hamilton, then we've got Councillor Morris. Thanks, Chair. Um, I was more interested in just to sidetrack a little bit in uh, the communication with the school and the issues that's been mentioned there. Um, I, I really like the services they're offering and what they're about, they're about the community, and each community is different, and we have to tailor the communities to what, what the needs are. Uh, but I was disappointed, really, that like we've, we've got a head teacher here who's sort of saying um, there's a lack of communication, uh, and I didn't like that. Thank you, Councillor Armstrong. Uh, just before I bring you in, uh, Councillor Armstrong, uh, Miss Stewart, did you say you wanted to come in? Yes, yes, please. Can I? It was just in response to um, Councillor Clark's um, points that he he made, just in relation to sort of viability and the um, where the 106 um, contribution figure has, has come from. So in this instance, because um, the compensation concerns making the principle of development acceptable, um, whilst it's recognised that the applicants are a charity, viability is is not a consideration, um, and the 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 sum. Um, that is, is sought as mitigation um, has actually been reduced over the course of the application um, having regard to uh, the actual size of the grass area lost so therefore it was reduced from uh, I think it started at 115 it was reduced to, to just uh, just short of 109,000 um, but as as well as that um, that was that is still the 2018 figure um, the, the we've sought to be as flexible as possible by sort of not not updating that figure which if we went with the 2021 figure I think we'd be back up at about 150 um, and also sought to agree that we that we wouldn't um, index link the, the payment um, and not include any monitoring fee and also to allow 
the applicants to pay it over um, staged payments rather than upfront, which is, is normally the case in this instance. Uh, as you'll see, members, the, the officers have been as flexible as possible about, about the financial uh, mitigation about the loss of this recreational space. Is that okay? Okay, I'll move on to Councillor Morris. Oh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm concerned that the head teacher mentioned that a, a, a car park would increase the danger to children. So, can I ask the officers what mitigating factors that could be put in place so that children didn't suffer further risk of accident, please? Miss Stewart, would you just go back through the tree survey and, and what's happening with the, the trees? Um... Yeah. Um, so I noted that um, the head teacher of the school referenced a new tree survey, um, which has done, been done more recently. We've not had sight of that um, in, in relation to this application, but I think the tree that he is referring to is one that sits towards the, the back corner of the site. So um, if it's the same one, we've had some discussions about it in the past. Um, it's actually shown as being retained on the, the planning application. Um, and so we we put um, a couple of years ago now the, the school in contact with the applicants to, to discuss now if it's the case that um, the, the tree is, is dangerous um, or, or in a, a poor state then there are um, obviously exemptions for because uh, it would normally require TPO consent to be to be removed or pruned so I, I suggest that's something that we could pick up outside of this application because it's not uh, necessary for the tree to be felled to accommodate the application so I think we need some discussions separately alongside that so if the head teacher could contact me in the first instance um, I can pick it up with uh, with them directly. No problem I, I think Councillor Morris would appreciate that thanks Adele. Thank you. Thank you Ms Stewart. It, it was more the car park and the effect on the children that I was concerned about and, and what we could do to mitigate that. Okay Ms Stewart did you pick that up from Councillor Morris? Yeah, um, was it not the case that the head teacher um, was, was quite welcoming of the car park to remove the, the cars off the, the street to assist with the um, children sort of coming and going from, from school? That was my understanding, what I took from his comments. Council Warmshin. Yeah, I, I, I think... Yeah. Can I just say that the, the car park would be welcome and make the area a lot safer. Yeah. Um, at the moment, Northumberland Street is probably one of the worst streets in Salford for cars. Uh, and anything we can do to get cars off the road, we need to do. Uh, and, and also, it's a, another whinge of mine that I've been on about for years. And it occurs a lot councillors know about is we put build outs on the road years ago for safety reasons but we just don't need them now because the, the road's that busy it's just causing problems uh, and the, the build outs have got partial yellow lines at junctions but not so cars are just parking on it so it's it, it's like Northumberland Street needs a good traffic review. Okay members uh, let, let's just see if we can straighten ourselves up a little bit here. Uh, the, the officers have been quite frank with us that the, the, the proposal for the built environment is, is, is not objectionable from the officers point of view. The objection is quite simple is, is that are you willing uh, to go to ride over what is essentially a piece of legislation that all, all acknowledged and recognised recreational space the loss of should be mitigated for uh, and you need a justifiable reason to go over that. Uh, we usually ask for a viability statement in such a case, but in this instance, I don't believe uh, a viability statement is actually uh, a, a, a request. Also, within that piece of legislation too, and what is defined by central government, is that being status is, is, is not is not worthy of overriding it. It's it's not it's not there. It's not so. It's already been sought for and, and, and dealt with. So you it's, it's this it's within this panel's gift to override. But if you feel you have such justification to be able to go against what you've been in the past been extremely strong about in the last couple of months, we've had a site that has been creation space. 
and made sure, and you deferred, and made sure that you got that, that money, and it was the appropriate amount of money to, to replenish what was going to be lost. And that was also in private ownership, and that was also locked away from public use. And yes, there was also no bowling club knocking on the door to say that they wanted to use it, but it is defined recreational space. And in policy, and in government policy, and in national and in local policy, it, it, it is shrouded of protection to be mitigated against for its loss. And, and so there's your question. Have you heard enough today to go against that, uh, uh, against what was recommended? So uh, I haven't heard any motions for or against the officer's recommendation at this moment in time, but, but that's, that's your decision. As I say, members of the, the officers are not saying that the built environment is unapprovable. What they're saying is they cannot approve it because, because that, to, mit to allow that to happen, it needs to mitigate itself. And one of the pure principles of planning is that the impact of planning must mitigate what it builds and what it does. And in this instance, it sets out in national policy and in local policy that there is money owes to go towards a recreational facility because this is considered to be a recreational site where the car park is identified for and that will lead to a, a loss of recreational space and that needs to be mitigated against. I'll be quiet now. I'm not here to lecture. I'll just tell you that's the position and that's where we need to be and that's the decision where we are we need to be making. Sorry, Councillor McCuskey. Chair, I'm sorry I didn't make it clear when I spoke before, but I, I'm moving that we um, accept the recommendation of the officer and refuse this application. Councillor Cusack? Um, I'd like to second that motion, Chair, uh, on exactly the grounds that you've explained um, that we are uh, potentially losing uh, open space and there are, no, um, there are no proposals to mitigate that loss of open space. Thank you, Councillor Cusack. Okay, is there any other motions contrary to the officer's recommendation? Okay, members, it's been moved and seconded for the application to be refused with the officer's recommendation. All in favour of that refusal, please show. Anyone against that? And any abstentions? Okay, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, the application has been refused. Thank you so much for your attendance. Uh, we're going to carry on with the public meeting, so uh, if you do need to leave, please do leave in such a way not to disturb the rest of the meeting from... Uh, from uh, being able to progress. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Greener, lovely to see you. Please come over. Uh, Miss Edwards, could we, could we get Councillor Greener? Councillor Greener, is it a cup of tea or coffee? A cup of coffee. Any sugars? No, no you're, you're definitely sweet enough, thank you. Sir. No problem. Okay. Sorry? I can't hear. It's okay. Okay. Mo Councillor Guido, is it, is it okay if we fire up and get going while you get your papers in? Is that okay? Okay, members, it's item uh, 5B, which is land at Wall Street. Uh, Mr. Allen, can I hear you yourself? Morning, Chair. Yes, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, Mr. Allen, could you just have another shout at that, please? Okay, I'll, uh, I'll speak up a bit. Can you, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, you, you're doing fine for me now. Uh, Mr. Williams, could you maximise Mr. Allen's screen, please? Or maximise the, thank you. And Mr. Allen, could you go forward a slide and back a slide? Fabulous. Okay, Mr. Allen, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. So this application relates to an approximately 0.3 hectare site on Morrill Street in Audsall and seeks full planning permission for the demolition of existing buildings and construction of two seven-storey buildings comprising 164 dwellings. The site sits to the north of Worrell Street, which forms a loop together with Everard Street, connecting in towards Sol Lane to the north. Dyer Street sits to the northern boundary of the site, connecting towards Sol Lane at its northern point, and currently terminates at the edge of the application site. The site is currently host to two buildings, one of which is occupied by a freight and logistics company as a depot, the second of which is occupied by a blinds manufacturer. Surrounding land uses are mixed with a combination of employment or former employment uses, together with residential uses including Bridgewater Point and Lambert Court to the east. Additionally, a number of sites within the immediate vicinity are currently subject to development works comprising the delivery of further residential uses. Manchester Ship Canal sits to the south of the site, separated by existing buildings and a development site. 
The site sits within the Old Salt Riverside area and is therefore located within an evolving context, with this section of the corridor transitioning from a previously predominantly commercial area to a residential neighbourhood. Development within the area is guided by the Council's Old Salt Riverside planning guidance and the accompanying master plan, which set down the Council's broad vision for the regeneration of the area and the principles of development to create a cohesive and distinctive character and sense of place with an appropriate mix of uses. The site, indicated with a red circle on screen, sits within the Regent Road quarter character area south, and the Council's planning guidance for this section of the corridor sets parameters relating to scale, and for this site sets a maximum height parameter of six plus one storeys. The Old Silver Riverside planning guidance also seeks to direct the general urban form of development across the corridor, together with delivery of strategic links to ensure permeability and accessibility to the residential growth areas. In this respect, Dyer Street, which currently connects towards Sol Lane but terminates at the site boundary, is identified as an opportunity for creation of a permeable network of urban blocks, including the delivery of a full link between Orsall Lane and Worrell Street. As previously noted, the area has undergone and continues to undergo significant change, and the site sits within the centre of one of the larger scale urban blocks. Bridgewater Point, which sits to the east of the site, was completed within the last couple of years and is now occupied. North and northwest of the application site is the site at 221 to 223 Oldsall Lane, which benefits from planning permission for residential development, now known as Merchant's Wharf. South of the site, on the opposite side of Worrell Street, is a parcel of land which is in the advanced stages of being built out with a residential scheme known as the Waterhouse. In looking at the scale of development within the wider context, Bridgewater Point is part six, seven and eight storeys in height, given its position on key frontages along Orsall Lane and Everard Street. Similarly, Merchant's Wharf to the north and northwest is a part seven, part nine storey scheme, and the Waterhouse scheme to the south, in light of its riverside frontage, reaches a maximum height of nine storeys. Members may recall that the Council previously considered an application for development of the application site in 2017, at which point the site had been combined with a parcel of land on the opposite side of Worrell Street. Although that scheme benefited from a resolution to grant planning permission following consideration at a panel meeting in November 2017, the applicant was unable to complete the land assembly process, the Section 106 agreement was never completed and the application was ultimately withdrawn. The second parcel of land contained within that application is now being built as the out as the Waterhouse Scheme under a separate planning permission granted in 2018. The section of the 2017 scheme which was proposed to sit on the current application site was similar in many respects to the current scheme under consideration in that it was formed of two separate blocks either side of a new extension to Dyer Street. The current scheme seeks to address the constraints and opportunities of the site in much the same way as the 2017 scheme and recognises, in accordance with the Orsall River Site Planning Guidance, the potential to create a link through the site as a continuation of Dyer Street. This allows for the creation of two separate blocks on site, one of which serves to complete the unfinished urban block created by the two buildings at Bridgewater Point. Site layout is therefore driven by the provision of the new extension of Dyer Street. Block A, the larger of the two, sits to the western side of the new public realm at the bottom of the plan on screen. And the smaller block, Block B, sits to the eastern side of Dyer Street and nestles between two gable elevations at Bridgewater Point. Parking for 26 cars is included at the base of Block A, with access via a secure entrance off Worrell Street. Dyer Street would not be accessible to motor vehicles and deliveries and servicing of the development would be facilitated by way of provision of a new loading bay on Worrell Street. Cycle parking is also provided within the base of each building with a total provision of 80 spaces, 40 within each block. The Dyer Street link would be delivered by the developer as part of construction of the scheme, including provision of high quality hard landscaping interspersed with ornamental and rain garden planting. The new link would benefit from a high degree of natural surveillance and small private terraces would be provided to the ground floor units on either side of Dyer Street to provide a sense of activity and also defensible space between the public realm and the dwellings. Although officers are satisfied with the general principles of the submitted landscaping scheme, a detailed scheme is required to be agreed by way of a condition. Upon submission, the application sought permission for the delivery of a seven storey building and an eight storey building. 
Concerns were raised with respect to the conflict with the parameters set out in the Oddsall Riverside Planning Guidance, the way in which the scheme would sit within the townscape formed by existing and approved surrounding developments, and the detailed design of the upper stories of the buildings. The applicant has subsequently worked positively with officers to reduce the scale of the scheme and has revised the application such that both blocks are now seven stories in height and comply with the parameters set out in the planning guidance relating to delivery of buildings of six plus one stories in scale, meaning that they have a subordinate setback top floor. Final design therefore comprises a scheme which would nestle at the centre of the wider urban block and has an appropriately scaled street frontage onto Worrell Street. The top floor of the building along Worrell Street is set back entirely from the main wall of the building and also integrates recessed terraces which provide private amenity space for residents and which also reduce the perceived bulk of the building when read from street level. Similarly, along Dyer Street, the upper most section of the building benefits from similar setbacks and the provision of generous terraces which provide outdoor amenity space for the larger and three bedroom apartments on the upper floors. The provision of balconies along the Dyer Street elevations increases the sense of engagement between the building and the new public realm below, further increasing the sense of natural surveillance. Turning to the housing mix, the scheme comprises a mix of one, two and three bedroom apartments, together with provision of 11, two and three bedroom duplex townhouses in order to add to the supply of larger dwellings coming forward within the corridor in accordance with the Old Soul Riverside planning guidance. These townhouses, shaded orange on the on-screen plan, are located on the lower floors of Block A and benefit from provision of those external amenity spaces which front onto Dyer Street. The internal layout across the remaining floors of each building is relatively consistent with provision of a mixture of one, two and three bedroom apartments across each floor. And the majority of dwellings within the scheme benefit from provision of their own dedicated balcony fronting out towards Worrell Street or into the new section of Dyer Street. On the uppermost floors of each block, three bedroom units would be provided on the Dyer Street elevations and each would benefit from provision of a private terrace inset from the building edge. In addition to the private outdoor amenity space provided to those apartments with balconies and terraces, the developer has also sought to provide three communal amenity spaces. Two of these are located within Block A and comprise a residence lounge adjacent to the entrance lobby, together with a co-working and kitchen and lounge space at first floor level above. An additional area of communal amenity space is provided on the top floor of Block A, which comprises a roof terrace with both open air and covered spaces to be accessible to residents of both blocks. Although the finer detail and specification will be subject to agreement by way of condition, the applicant has set out an initial material strategy for the development, which focuses on the use of high quality facing brickwork. The uppermost floor of the buildings is to be faced with a lighter tone of brickwork to further reduce the perceived height of the buildings and will make use of a more intricate basket weave brick pattern to add interest. The lower levels of the building, which form the interface with Dyer Street, are to be set in slightly to add a sense of depth to the facade, and window and door frames, together with the balconies, are proposed to be of a bronze finish to provide a complementary fit with the red brickwork. In light of the scale and nature of the development, an assessment of its impact on nearby transport infrastructure, public realm, open space and education provision was required, in accordance with the Council's relevant policies. The application was accompanied by a viability appraisal, which has been subject to scrutiny by the Council's surveyors, and the conclusion of the viability review was that the applicant's assertion that the scheme cannot support maximum contribution calculated in accordance with the Council's policy is sound. In light of the identified viability gap, the Council surveyors have recommended that the maximum initial financial contribution the scheme could provide is £491,500 once the cost of the public realm works to deliver the extension to Dyer Street have been taken into account. It is recommended that the initial contribution is prioritised towards delivery of transport and highways mitigation, including the contribution towards new or enhanced bus services within the vicinity of the development, a contribution towards car club provision and a contribution towards the cost of necessary amendments to traffic regulation orders along Worrell Street. 
These matters are considered to comprise essential mitigation in order to ensure a truly sustainable form of development where residents are not reliant on travel by private car and in order to mitigate potential highways impacts. The residual financial contribution is recommended to be directed towards projects for the improvement of open space in the vicinity of the site. It's recommended that a clawback mechanism is included within the Section 106 agreement to secure a further contribution up to the maximum policy compliant level should the viability of the development increase in the future with any clawback monies to be directed towards affordable housing, improvement of open space and or education provision. In summary, the scheme comprises the redevelopment of an area of previously developed land to create a high quality residential development, including a proportion of accommodation suitable for occupation by families. The scheme is considered to comply in principle with the relevant provisions of the development plan, including the Council's policies on mixed use development areas and the Oldsall Riverside and housing planning guidance. The scheme comprises delivery of a key parcel of the wider urban block and insofar as is now feasible, given the changing context to the site, meets with the ambitions of the Council's Wardsall Riverside Master Plan, in particular with respect to delivering the Dyer Street link from Wardsall Lane to Worrell Street. The development would not, on balance, give rise to unacceptable impacts on residential amenity for existing or future residents and would not have an unacceptable impact on the surrounding highway network comprising a sustainable form of development subject to the mitigation and enhancements to be secured by way of planning conditions and obligations. The proposal would therefore make a positive contribution to the regeneration of the Oldsall Riverside area and is recommended for approval, subject to the obligations and conditions set out at page 46 of the agenda report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Owen. Thank you so much. OK, uh, I do believe uh, we have a Ms. Phil Cox in the room who wishes to speak. Thanks, Helen. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Cox, uh, you're the applicants and agents, aren't you? Uh, we don't have any objectors in the room and no one's ready to speak, so I've just moved straight to applicants and agents. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Do you need 10 minutes or is five surprise? Uh, five would be plenty. Okay, I'll Thank be you. for Ms. Phil Cox. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you um, all this morning on behalf of my client, Primus Property Group. As presented very thoroughly by your officer, you will no doubt be familiar with the site, with a residential apartment scheme very similar in scale and nature to the one proposed by my client, having previously been minded to approve by committee in November 2017, which clearly established the principle of the residential redevelopment of this site. My client's proposals have been developed in close liaison with your planning and highways officers, who we have engaged positively with over a number of months and they present the opportunity for the long-term objectives of the Council as set out in the Audsall Riverside Planning Guidance and under the UDP MX1 allocation to be realised and deliver a further piece of the puzzle of the ongoing regeneration of Audsall Lane. To briefly summarise the positive benefits of the proposals, these will include the following. Well-designed apartments and townhouses with a policy compliance mix of units with all apartments meeting or exceeding the nationally described space standards. These include a number of three-bedroomed homes with private terraces at the ground floor along Dyer Street, as well as on the upper levels. A large proportion of the one- and two-bedroom apartments also benefit from well-sized private balconies. A communal external terrace, including an area of undercover space, as well as shared internal amenity space for residents within Block A, the creation of a new area of public realm and a pedestrian and cycle route through the development along Dyer Street, a clear objective of the Audsall Riverside guidance. This is to be delivered as part of the scheme and will include high quality hard and soft landscaping, including timber topped seating and cycle stands for visitors, while also delivering biodiversity net gain benefits. A well-designed scheme which, whilst temporary in form, is contextually appropriate and uses high quality materials, contributing positively to the emerging context of the Oldsall Lane Corridor. From a sustainability perspective, the development will follow a fabric-first approach, which will include enhanced insulation to the building and an engineered facade to minimise thermal losses, as well as reduced air permeability. Furthermore, all homes will be fitted with efficient heating, ventilation and hot water systems. In terms of planning obligations, again, as set up by your officer, an agreement is in place for my client to make a substantial financial contribution 
in line with your planning obligations, SPD, alongside the delivery of the on-site public realm improvements to Dyer Street, making a meaningful contribution towards the ongoing renaissance of Ordsall Riverside. To conclude, my client, Primus Property Group, is committed to delivering the high-quality redevelopment of this site in line with the well-established planning guidance for, the, for Ordsall Riverside, the City of Salford UDP and the MPPF. I do hope that you're able to support your officer's recommendation today. Thank you. Ms. Wilcox, cheers. Uh, your colleague, Ms. Birchall, is not speaking, is she? There's no one speaking, she should tell. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, there's no board council which should speak or present, so I'm just going to open up the debate. Um, as you can see with the sign history, we've had an application extremely similar to this in the past. Councillor Kuzak, anyone else? Councillor Fresden? Councillor Kuzak, Councillor Guido. Uh, th thanks, Chair. Um, um, I was concerned uh, about this application on a number of grounds um, in terms of uh, water pollution uh, and uh, archaeology and its relationship to um, surrounding developments as well as uh, the car parking issue. But I think the officers uh, have dealt with all, all of my concerns. I think there's a comprehensive set of conditions here uh, attached to this planning application. I think it, it will... Um, as the applicant, uh, uh, as the applicant's agent has stated, it will assist in, in our efforts to uh, regenerate Salford and particularly this area of Salford. Uh, therefore, I would like to uh, move approval, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, I, I believe it's improved since the previous uh, scheme. I mean, we've got more front doors to streets. The public realm space between that is is highly much more uh, better now. And uh, yeah, we're on, on for 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 the. The people of Odsall Lane, we've got a good contribution there towards what is a vital future bus service. Uh, so, yeah. Councillor President, Councillor Guido. Um, Everard Street and, and the un double yellow lined world's, world Street are pretty much already full of cars. So, I do have concerns that adding more developments without sufficient car parking space is, in the short term, going to be quite painful. In the long term, the council is asking for money for bus, lay, bus services and uh, extra provision in, in active and walking transport kind of thing. Um, can I ask, what is the minimum cycle parking standard that we ask of developers? Mr. Allen. Uh, thank you, Chair. So in terms of, of the standards which are set out within the, the Council's UDP, in terms of, of minimum standards for, for cycle parking provision, um, we, we are considering an application for, for flats and apartments. It's provision of a minimum Mr. Allen, I think we'll need to repeat that. I think our microphones might all, well, our speakers all cut out at the same time. Did everyone lose sound at the same time then? Yeah, I'd like to say minimum. Yeah. Mr. Allen, can you still hear us? Uh, Mr. Stevenson, can you speak down the microphone to see if it's out there? Ah, hello, Chair. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, I think we've lost Mr. Allen. So in, in the meantime, uh, uh, did, did you catch Council President's question? Chair, it's, it's one locker per five um, units. Yep, can you just repeat that? I, I couldn't get... Uh, one cycle space per five units is the standard in the UDP. No, sure. Councillor President. For, for the sake of clarity, the local plan, Annex C, has a set of minimum cycle parking standards. How do they fit in with the UDP? Which one takes precedent because they're not the same? Mr. Shuttleworth, there you go. Yeah. Um, obviously, the local plan is moving through its examination. Yeah. Some policies we can give, begin to give something like the UDP at the moment as the prevailing policy over the council. But we will, we're revising as policies enable themselves to get some weight to go through the process. But it's, uh, it's, it's still an emerging plan at the moment. Thank you. And the council chosen it. Are you after more cycle spaces? Um, the cycle spaces are they they satisfy the UDP. They yeah. do not. They would not satisfy the local plan. 
Okay, but you can, you, you can always try and challenge the chair to a test, you know, to go back and have a little conversation with the developer and see if we can get some more spaces in there or some more. You know, that would be very welcome. So yes. I'm quite happy to go and have that conversation. Can't promise anything, but we'll certainly go and ask that question. Okay. Because I, I, know, I, know, I know developers, they want to be as sustainable as possible. They want to, they want to meet those things, and if they can get it in, they do. Because there is a demand for it, and, and they want to meet that demand, and that's the reason why these things are being built, because the market lets so, yeah. Sorry, Tristan. So my, my second concern, which is more of a comment than a question, is around the area, is um, this is being built in a mixed use area, but it's 100% residential which fits within the Ottawa Riverside plan because it's in the, the centre of that area. But I'm aware that other developments in parts that should be 50% non-residential don't seem to be. So I think there is a danger, if we're not careful, that we'll just fill the entire area with 100% residential units and not really put in any commercial or non-residential units, which would be not a mixed-use development area in the end. So I think we just need to be mindful of that. Yeah, I get that. The, uh, the, uh, as the SDP, as the SPD was produced, the, the market was in a very strange place from, from my, my, my understanding. But what, what has definitely come about, though, is that down Hodsall Lane, as new developments have come across, is that uh, uh, street usage on Hodsall Lane has changed. Uh, we've seen the further developments uh, for that more uh, affront into Hodsall Hall. Uh, their, their Riverside frontage usage has changed uh, in their resubmissions uh, to uh, uh, cafes, uh, shops, etc. Uh, and that's exactly what the SDP, SPD in, aspired to, is to celebrate the river, uh, as well as Odso Lane, and get that connection from Odso Lane to the river. And uh, it, it wasn't able to force it from that at the market, but the market has changed as it's gone, and we seem to be getting that, and it's, it's uh, very encouraging, but yeah, more, more the better, really, because the more thoughtful, creative, well, I've always put it another way, is, is that we don't want Salford to be a dormitory, uh, for, for, the, for the other city, we want it, for it to be a place to live, play and, uh, and, and, and work and, and that, that bit of uh, play in the bit in the middle is cafes, is, is amenities isn't it really, you know, to do that with, so yeah, I'm bang on with that. I'm trying to find that condition where you, you want to de delegate the sign off of the cycling provision to the, in consultation with the chair and then we'll get that conversation, but I can't find the number so I'm going to ask the officers to do it, to apologize. Uh, is it? Thank you, Councillor Chesson. Councillor Guido. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I've just got a couple of comments. Um, too many one-bedroom apartments. Uh, we are looking for less one-bedroom apartments, I think, and more two- and three-bedroom apartments, according to uh, the document I have in front of me. Uh, the second one is no affordable housing, no affordable apartments. Um, I don't get it. We're, we're, we want affordable, uh, we want people to be able to live close to the city centre so that they can work. And my third point is, and I've just got it, uh, <laughs> my third point is, are any of these uh, disabled friendly? Uh, because we need to be providing accommodation for people in wheelchairs, will there be wide doors on any of these? Uh, will there be lifts? Will there be um, a a access for these people? Um, and um, it's not just the disabled. I mean, elderly people actually need somewhere that's um, got wide doors, I think, probably to get their Zimmer frames through. Um, so I'm a bit concerned about uh, this development um, I think it's an ideal spot uh, for um, for people to actually get into Manchester um, and to actually use the, uh, the, the the Manchester Ship Canal. So I'm not happy with it. I think it's far too many one bedrooms, not enough two bedrooms, and not enough three bedrooms. Um, we say that it shouldn't be predominantly one bedroom. Well, this is predominantly one bedroom. Thank you. I want them to stay in Salford, Councillor Guido. So, uh, but yeah, I, it, yeah, we, we, you are, you, it is, you, I'm with you all the way. But we're, we're in a market-led system, so yeah, we, we do want to see a, an even greater mix than what we've got. It's policy compliant, but we, we get what the market gives us with the, with the world we're in. So, can I can I come back on that? Sorry, uh, no, we don't. I think if we're a council, 
that wants to provide accommodation for certain people, then we make developers understand what we want. You know, I mean, I'm not saying that these developers will walk away. If they do, there's other people. I think we need to be starting to make a stand. I am absolutely sick to death of hearing, well, it's, it's this policy or it's that policy right. We are the councillors for this city. And we as councillors on this planning, all right, we need to work within rules. But I have to say that we need to be sending out a message there to these developers that this is not acceptable. Sorry. Well, it's policy compliant, so it's 50% affordable. With the DDA compliance, etc., we are in the land of regulation, aren't we, with that? So we can't, we, we uh, you know, if, if, it's a, if it's a particular usage for assisted living, etc., then yeah, we do expect you to get above a standard. But, but we are in the land of regulations. So, so, so I'm not saying it doesn't meet it. I'm saying that, that I'm going to ask and get you the answer, and it's fine to me. But, but we are in the land of regulations when it comes to door sites, etc., getting getting it accessible. And don't forget, we've got nine front doors to streets here, which previous application didn't have. So, so hopefully they are. So let's get you that answer. Mr. Allen, are you still there now? Councillor Peter, I'm, 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 not, I'm not trying to wind you up at all, I'm just, just trying to get the answers for your questions. Can I just say, it's though, just the world we're in, so. if, if I'm a young person and I'm disabled, I don't want to go, probably don't want to go to an assisted living space, I want to be among people that I... That I, I, I never said they should, Councillor Green, I, I never said they should, all I'm saying, I'm just trying to get you the answer. Mr Allen, are you there? No, OK, Mr Stevenson. Uh, when, when it comes to uh, accessibility of these buildings, what's, our, what's the most we can push in policy before we hit regulation? Hi there, Chair. It's James, James here. Um, I'm happy to, to kind of pick up some of these questions in, in David's absence, if that's OK. Yes, um, please do, Mr Kelly. I think in, in, in this instance, we're, uh, we're very much um, governed, um, or building regs will apply to the scheme. Um, so um, whilst it's important that this um, application doesn't kind of create barriers to, to kind of free movement through the through the public realm and, uh, and around the site, um, the sort of internal layout and accessibility of the individual units themselves will be governed by building regs. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Thank you so much. Councillor Warmshire. Yeah, just, just a quick comment, really. If the more you see this area developed, the worry that I have is that we're going to lose that graffiti walk. <laughs> uh, I think you see some of the art that's down there. It, it, it really is good graffiti art, proper graffiti art. And I just think that we're actually seeing it diminishing. Uh, there's nowhere else in the city for spray artists to work. So I, I really do have concerns that we're, we're losing that graffiti walk. The most ever I'm ever going to claim to be an artist is I, the, the community wall down there at Wogan Street Bridge, I painted the lacquer to stop other graffiti going over the top of it. That's as close as I'll ever get to doing art, is to paint some clear. So, yeah, yeah uh, I think it's a challenge for the ward councillors to keep that, to keep that cool shot. Sorry, Councillor Clark, I think you did indicate, and no, I haven't written you down, I do apologise. I've got Councillor Clark, I've got Councillor Hamilton. I echo what uh, Karen said about it before. We've been saying for five years now, I still don't find it acceptable that these apartment blocks provide no affordable homes, irrespective of what policy says. But we need to do better. I'm sick to death of looking at dull, boring buildings. There's nothing mitigating nice this. If there's no green credentials on it, there's not a tree, you know, a green wall, something. We need to do something and build square, boring, drab, horrible blocks. I'm sick to ever looking at them. I can't stand them. And why why can not anything have a curve anymore? Why is everything square? You know, you look around, everything's square and horrible and we need to do better and provide green environmental credentials for these things. Green wall. A couple of years ago we approved one in Apple's and the green wall is fantastic. But we, we've done nothing since and I think we need to write like Thank you, Councillor Clark. Uh, Councillor Hamilton? Thanks, Chair. And may, maybe this is in the realm to sort of say this, anyhow. Um, what I'm thinking is, in my new area of Blackfriars, um, given the 
uh, have inherited a lot of apartments. I've got massive issues with landlords. Hey, Councillor Hamilton, I need to keep you to this application. Just, I just wondered if there's anything we can put it on the table for future to discuss. That's all I mean. Activity uh, at the end of this month as a panel uh, for ourselves. Oh, yes, yeah, by, by all means, I, I think that's the best form for it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you. okay. To be a negative about this application, but I don't have a resolution on the table. So, did Councillor Kuska? Yeah, uh, can I move the accept the recommendation of the officers? Thank you. Pass it. Thank you. Councillor Kuska? Thank you. Uh, members, could I ask you to delegate conditions, well, the, the 106 condition? Uh, the only thing I have a concern about on the 106 is that the car club, we haven't really defined what our car club is in the city and we have a definite amount towards the car club there and I would prefer it to be an and or because if it's definitely an and then the money has to go to a car club so we need to make sure that that, that 106 contract is appropriately worded to give us the flexibility to be able to put that contribution to back to the buses if we need to so if you would be so kind to delegate the consultation with the chair, condition, the 106 condition uh, condition 9, which is materials, and condition 17, which is the cycle parking provision to, to, in, in, to the relevant officer in consultation with the chair. We have happy to do that, members? Okay, I see nods. Okay, members, it's been moved and seconded for approval with the, uh, the conditions 106, 9 and 17 uh, in delegation with the chair. Uh, all in favour of that, please show. Anyone against? And any abstentions? Ladies and gentlemen, the application has been approved. Thank you so much. Uh, members, it's 11.16, you've been here for an hour and a quarter, three, three quarters now. Uh, you do need a coffee break, you do need a break. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we do have some fresh tea and coffee. I do need to give the members of the panel a break. Uh, it's all on me, badly timed. Uh, I should have put a break in at this section. So we, we'll, we'll just kind of adjourn for a short time and we're going to start again at 11.30. Is that okay? It's 13 minutes. Is that okay? I can offer you a cup of tea or coffee. Uh, I can make that happen for you.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, our next item will be 5C, but just before we, we start that item, uh, Miss Edwards, uh, would you just uh, read out who's present for this next session, please? Yes, Chair. The panel members present are councillors Bob Clark, Bill Cusack, Jim Dawson, Karen Garrido, Jane Hamilton, Mike McCusker, Margaret Morris, Neil Reynolds, Peter Taylor, Phil Tresider, and yourself, Chair. And just to show I was paying attention, I believe that's 11 members. Yes, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Uh, members, everyone uh, got item 5C on their screens or, uh, you know, at that point? Any, any problems? No, nope. silence is, is okay. Okay, Mr. Stevenson, I believe you're presenting this application. I am, Chair. Hopefully, oh, great. Could you go nice forward a slide and back a slide? Yep. You'll need to go forward a slide. Yeah, there you go. It, it happened then. Is that okay? Yeah. You have the floor, Mr. Stevenson. Thank you so much. Okay, looks to do a better three or four second delay on the slides. Um, but we'll see how we get on. Uh, so this application, members, is re uh, relates to Salford City Roosters playing fields on Holsworth Road, and it's for uh, the erection of 2.4 metre high metal fencing and gates to go around the first team rugby pitch adjacent to the currently being constructed clubhouse. So the red line shows the extent of where the new fence would be. You can see it sits adjacent to housing that fronts off to Schofield Road. Uh, there's housing along Barton Hall Avenue, which also provides uh, pedestrian access into the, the, the area, uh, with vehicular access coming along Hallsworth Road in this location into a car park, with a new clubhouse being erected in this position here. Um, to the west of the site, we've got Worsley Brook, and beyond that, Port Salford Greenway, which is accessed from Holsworth Road at this point here, and also um, at this point here. So this shows the recently um, approved application for the new clubhouse. And what it's showing is that that included fencing around the clubhouse itself in order to, to protect that from, from some of the um, problems that the, the club had been experiencing with, with vandalism. So this current application which members are asked to consider effectively removes um, part of the fence in this area here and um, puts it around that first team rugby pitch. Uh, the reason being they have experienced some vandalism but also uh, occasions of, of dog fouling on the pitch and so it's to, to protect the playing surface um, for, for the rugby players when they when they come to play. Um, it would it would be a paladin style fence, which is what we typically see around uh, schools. So it's, it's common within the urban environment. And this proposal uh, wouldn't affect uh, public access into the field areas uh, that will be maintained around this area across the second team pitch, which is to the north of the first team pitch uh, and through into uh, the public footpaths there. So this is a view at the end of Holsworth Road back towards uh, the new Clubhouse, which is, is quite an advanced state now, um, and public access is just at this point here, down adjacent to the, the pitches. That's the uh, access point that I'm making reference to. You can see the first team pitch just in, in shot there, with the route um, down in that location. And this is a view back in the opposite direction, and you can see the clubhouse there in the, in the distant view. So just in terms of uh, representations that we've had on this application, uh, you'll know from the report that 22 residents have objected. I'm just showing on this plan here, the red, uh, sorry, the blue squares were those residents who uh, were sent a, an individual letter in addition to, to site notices. The red triangles are those in the immediate vicinity who've raised concerns with the application and those concerns are set out within the officer's report. Um, we have had an additional representation from Councillor Mullard this morning, and just to summarise what that says, uh, members, uh, he expresses that he's unhappy, that there would be a loss of access to open space. Uh, he set out that the reason the main pitch is being fenced off is because of what he terms irresponsible dog walkers fouling the pitch, uh, but he considers that to be, um, you know, fencing the pitch being a, a punishment for everybody because of the, the few that are, uh, that are causing that issue. Um, 
and he's talked about that if it is um, refused, if, if it's not refused, rather, if it's approved, he would ask that um, access to the Greenway is maintained um, at all times, uh, which this application uh, would do. It's not, not proposing to close off general access to the field. Um, and also that um, he says the rest of the land be designated as leisure and protected from further development. I mean, that's not something that uh, we can do through this. It, it, it is open space, is, is the site already, so it's designated as, as leisure land, but we'd have to consider any application on its merits uh, as it as it com comes forward. Uh, its final point is that um, it considers there's no need for the extra triangle section of fencing, in his view, which I presume is referring to this this area here. Um, in addition to the concerns being raised, you'll note from the report that there is a petition in support of the application and that, as of this morning, has been signed by 539 people. So in summary, um, the application is allocated in the Salford Green Spaces strategy as an area of open space. Uh, its primary uses as sports pitches and this proposal is to improve the use of those sports pitches. Um, the fencing will clearly protect uh, and enhance that sports team pitch with the second team pitch and wider area unaffected uh, with public access being allowed around it. Um, it's worth saying there is no public right of way uh, through the site, but public access will nonetheless be, be maintained. Um, it's not considered the fence would cause any visual amenity harm for the area. Uh, and there's no impact on car parking as part of the proposal and therefore chair the recommendation is to approve the application thank you mr stevenson okay uh, i don't believe there's any objectors in the room or anyone registered to speak are you okay yes, sorry, I'm just... sorry, I'm... It, was, it was a bit choppy yeah. did, did you hear any of it yes yeah Did half, halfway 75 percent I'm not being flippant, I'm just asking because I'll get Anthony to re redo that bit because I need you to hear the whole presentation. So. No problem. Mr Stevenson? Yes, Chair. Could we, could we rerun the presentation from the bit where it was about the consultation? Okay, Councillor Guido. No problem, Chair. So this final slide here. Was, the, was it the final uh, slide, yeah, so Councillor Guido? Was it the final slide? It was where he spoke about if there was 27 objections or I think it was 27 objections and what they were uh, and I actually missed that because then he mitigated that. So, so if Anthony starts from the, from the start of this slide, so Mr Stevenson starts from the start of this slide, are we okay? No problem, Councillor Mr Stevenson, could we start from, from this slide please and then finish off? Is that okay? Thank you. Yep, no problem at all, Chair. Um, yeah, so you can see from this slide that um, we've had a total of 22 residents objecting to this application and the location of, of those who live uh, in closest proximity to the site are shown with the red triangles on this application. You'll see on page 55 of the agenda uh, full detail there of what the concerns are that have been raised by those residents. Uh, in addition, we have received a representation this morning from Councillor Mullen. Um, he set out a number of concerns. Uh, he feels that the, um, the, 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 the majority, as it were, are being punished by the uh, negligent behaviour of the, of the few due to the, the dog fouling on the pitch. And he's concerned about that general right of access being lost. Uh, um, he talks about um, maintaining access for the public to the Greenway, which this application would, would allow that access. Um, and uh, he talks about the land being designated as leisure, which it is already designated as, as open space for recreation purposes. And he, he asked that any further land be protected from further development. And that would be a matter that would have to be considered on a case by case basis, but there is no proposal before us to, to uh, develop the wider site and the strong policy protection against that in any case. Um, his final point is that he is querying um, whether it is necessary to include what he terms uh, the extra triangle section, which I presume is this area here. Um, and also you can see from this slide there that we have also um, seen a petition referenced by the applicant that has been signed in support of the application uh, by 539 people as of this morning. 
Was that a uh, clear, Chair? Would you like me to summarise the final slide again? We've, we've, we've got all thumbs, Mr Stevenson. Please carry on. Yep, so in, in summary, there is a, a lag. I'll just wait for my slide to catch up. I think you can see that now. Um, so the, the site is allocated in the Salford Green Spaces strategy as an area of open space used as sports pitches. So this development would be in accordance with that policy insofar as it would improve the recreational um, use of that site as first team rugby pitch. Um, access would remain around the site uh, and through through the site area, uh, just not across the foot, first team football pitch. Um, no concerns about visual amenity from the fence, given it's a type of fence which we see uh, in many locations around schools across the city. Uh, and this wouldn't have any impact on car parking either, and so it's recommended for approval, Chair. Thank you, Mr Stevenson. OK, I don't have any objectors in the room or anyone wishing to speak from the objectors side. I do have the applicants and the applicants' uh, agents in the room. Mr Early, Mr Early. Mr. Early, do you need ten minutes or does five suffice? Oh, fabulous. Mr Early, please, please take a seat in the golf chair. Thank you. And, uh, Whenever you're ready, please get started. I'll give you a shout at four minutes to help time with yourself. Is that okay? Perfect. Um, my name's Chris Irwin. I'm uh, the chairperson of South City Roosters Rugby League Club. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak today. As a rugby league club, we've been here for 41 years. Um, and, and we've been playing rugby league on those, on those pitches for, uh, for, for all those years. And there's been thousands of players that have come from the city of Salford and done very well through having the opportunity to play rugby league in this area. Um, we have teams from Cubs age, which is three to five year olds, through to open age, and I think our oldest player is around 56, so he's doing all right, keeping himself going. But at the moment, we we've got over 200 uh, playing members of the club. Um, the reason uh, for the, the fencing and, and, and the application for the fencing is, uh, as you just heard, the, the dog fouling is, is a massive issue. Um, the amount of uh, dog muck cleared on a daily basis by coaches is nothing short of disgraceful, in all honesty. Um, despite this, you know, we, we, we're only human when we do miss bits when, we, when we're clearing up this mess. And unfortunately, that means kids getting tackled in dog mess, which is a major health issue for, for these young kids and adults playing in it. Um, I had a complaint from a new parent last week who just brought her four-year-old child uh, to start the cub session and she couldn't believe the amount of dog mess around the pitches. We want a, a, a community club where parents feel welcome and they feel safe bringing their children and as much as we try and do that it is very very difficult because you need eyes of a hawk to, to, to find some of this stuff. On top of that there's been a hell of a lot of vandalism uh, over the last 40 years since we've been here as a club. Um, I think on one of the images you saw there we have um, concrete posts around the pitch that usually have steel railings um, over the last two, three months. Every time I go to the session there's another piece of steel that has been taken away, um, which is incredibly frustrating because it costs us a lot of money to replace. Um, when Station Road, uh, Swinton Lions Old Stadium, um, was, was knocked down and they kindly donated us their goalposts. Um, they were famous because they were the largest goalposts in the league in, in the world, um, and, and we were very grateful that they, they donated them to our club. And thought, so 20 years ago, somebody took a chainsaw to them and chopped them down. Um, this is the kind of vandalism that we keep getting at our clubs and at our club, and we want to protect our club. Um, recently, more recently, we had our equipment container. Uh, burnt down, which is at the side of the pitches. Uh, that was £6,000 worth of equipment burnt and ruined, which meant for two weekends we couldn't have rugby league games because we had no post protectors, we couldn't have tackle shields for the kids, uh, all sorts of uh, damage that just ended up children playing rugby league. Um, I, I say keep saying children, but adults as well. Um, we've, as, a, as a community club, we, we continuously trying to raise money. We have Sponsors that I put into the club uh, this year, we offered the opportunity for sponsors to put sponsor boards around the pitches. We had to stop at that because within the first week of the first sponsor boards going up, they were kicked down. Um, again, another source of income that we can bring into the club to, to put back into the community and, and give children and adults a wonderful uh, experience of, 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 of our great game. Um, the benefits to the community for the fence, and I heard the objections were that they don't see the reason they feel 
that um, you know it's down to a, 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 a few people of why we put the fence up. It's quite the opposite. We want to open our club up. We've got a wonderful new clubhouse that, thankful to Salford City Council and the Rugby League World Cup team to fund that. Um, we want that clubhouse will be open daily. The club and the pitches will be accessible to the local residents and the communities daily. We'll have a cafe in there. So if you're, you know, apparently bringing your two young children to the, ch to the club, you can sit and have a coffee and a croissant, and the, you know, young Billy and uh, whoever the, <laughs> the other child is can have a kick about on the pitches. It is open for the community. We are not closing it off from the community. If people want to walk around that pitch, they can do. Just don't bring your dogs. And uh, you know, there's plenty of other places around the area you can you can walk your dog and not let your dog have a run about. So it is there for the community. It is there for the residents. We want to work closer with the residents than we've ever done. Uh, and we've got a facility that we're very proud of. Uh, and hopefully, it will be a facility that the surrounding areas and, and the wider community can be proud of as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, I don't have anything uh, on else from the applicant's applicant agent side. Uh, I do have the uh, two ward councillors though. Councillor Boschel has said that she can't get into the meetings, she can't present, so I promise... Oh, she, Councillor Boschel's in now, okay. So, should, should we start with Councillor Boschel and see how it goes? Uh, Councillor Boschel? Hello, thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm, I managed to get in. Oh, great, Councillor Boschel. Councillor Boschel, uh, your five minutes whenever you're ready. Great to hear from you. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I do, I, I do actually share um, Councillor Mullen's concerns, but I am generally supportive of this application. I've been a local councillor since 2007, and I am aware of the good work the club do with young people and the problems they have over a num have had over a number of years. However, I, I do have concerns, as, as Councillor Mullen has. One of them is, who will maintain the narrow walkway around the pitch because it could quickly become overgrown and impede access. And the other is access to Port Salford Greenway. The purpose of the Greenway is, was to connect communities, Winton, Peel Green and Brookhouse, and encourage cycling and walking. I understand there will be a gap in the car park that will allow access across the car park without having to walk the length and breadth of the pitch. I'd want to be reassured that this would be safe access across the car park and also that it could not be closed at any time in the future. So generally I am supported but, supported, but I do want reassurances around those two issues. Thank you, Councillor Marshall. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thank you. Bye for now. And then Councillor Lancaster. Oh, great. Thanks very much for uh, allowing me to speak. Um, first of all, can I apologise uh, in one respect? When we've led large planning applications where there's objections like this, we as ward councillors like to convene a meeting in the area. We have to enable with managers to convene the meeting with residents to try and look at some of the anomalies which have been raised. Unfortunately, they haven't got a suitable building in the medical situations we're in. So we've not been able to have that public meeting. We have only met people individually. But those individuals have raised on a number of issues. But before I talk about those issues, can I emphasise that I also support the view that they do a superb job at the rugby club there with young people and adults playing rugby. Uh, we've got very few pitches in, in Salford for rugby, uh, but these two are crucial. Um, but, so the work they've been doing, I'm, I'm totally supportive of. But the issues which we had to raise with us at meetings was there was somebody had been passing around the message on the petition that there was all both pitches were go, the the first team pitch and the ordinary pitch were going to be fenced off. As far as I understand it, and it's quite clear that we would be opposed to the second pitch being closed up and. I'm told that it doesn't include closure anyway, so it's not going to be fenced. But nevertheless, we raised that issue. As Paula said, there was an issue raised about the pathway. One, it was raised, which is round the, the first team pitch, that the, the width of it was very narrow. Who was going to be responsible for maintaining it when, when that uh, was open? 
uh, I'm told that by Ali Jackson that they, the club themselves are responsible for the maintaining of that footpath. So it would be for them to make sure it happens and for us to keep make sure they do. They, uh, the access to Port Salford and the Greenway, we're very proud of our Salford Greenways and we want to make sure that access is, is available. It's a public access. And one of the concerns that residents had was they didn't want to have to be able to walk round from Hallsworth Road right round the pitch to get to the other side and continue the, through the access to the Greenway. We were told, as Paula said, that they will still be able to gain access through the car park because it, not vehicle access but pedestrian access. So if that's happened, I'd be happy with that situation. There was, as you mentioned also, a triangular piece of land which is referred to. As I understand it, this was the part of the original car park of the old club. And there's no plans for it in the current arrangement. So uh, I'm not clear what they intend to do with that in the long term. But certainly that triangular piece could be used for secondary car parking or it could be used for what we would we'd want to have some indication of what the intentions were. So generally... I'm supportive of the application, but make it clear that we think it's important that we talk to residents and the club themselves could talk to residents because we've had two different interpretations about the access situation to the pitches and the walkway. One of the access roads, won't name them, made it clear they'd like to see the access closed off completely and not go down that road. Um, and the other, other uh, ones have recommended the view that there should be more than one access. So I think we, what the end result is of the access could be talked about. We, it, as far as I understand it, it's not a, a right of way footpath, so there was no problem in closing that footpath where they're talking about closing. So I've not got a real issue on that. So those are the main things we've got. We want to see good relationship with the community. I'm sure the club do. We want to see the lo us as local council being involved as well to try and work with them to make sure that it isn't the nuisance which some people believe it may do. Well, I would just support the view that has been dog fouling. Um, there's as many residents which feel that the, the dog shouldn't be allowed on the green areas without leads and without control. That's something we would support. But generally, we would not really say that you should restrict the use of these sites to dogs and uh, not being allowed. So those are the main points which were raised to us by the public. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Councillor Lancaster. Thank you so much. Uh, Councillor Boschel, Councillor Lancaster, we're, we're going to uh, eject you in the most politest way from the meeting now, uh, as that's the protocol of the city. OK, thank you. You can continue Thank on you. watching the deliberations by the council website because it's been streamed live. So, okay. Thank you. Okay, members, we've heard from the councillors. Uh, we've heard from everybody there. So it's open up the debate. Councillor McCusker, I will just bring you in. And Councillor Cusack, I will bring you in. Bring you. Mr. Stevenson, uh, Mr. Williams, will you just maximise Mr. Stevens the, the screen again for Mr. Stevenson? Uh, Stevenson, could, could you just quickly, 30 seconds, just go through how the access is going to work so the... The greenway is going to still be there, uh, and, the, and the, the, what, what, what seems to be like a service arrangement of pathway. Could you just run through that for 30 seconds, just so members are completely clear? Yep, no problem, Chair. I've moved my slide. I'm just waiting for the uh, pictures to catch up. So I'll just I'll talk to this slide first of all, because it brings into view the second team pitch as well. So. Uh, there's two ways in which you can access the Greenway at the moment. One is along this route. That will not be affected in any way by this proposal. Um, the second access point is here. Um, now, at the moment, there is a res um, pedestrian access, rather, at the end of Barton Hall Avenue. And as I've mentioned, there's both pedestrian and vehicular access in from this point here. Um, access to the open space will not be changed at all. People can come through there as they do now. Um, there would be a, obviously you can't walk across the pitch and that's the issue because they're trying to protect the playing surface. Uh, but access would be maintained along this route here. It's been checked by the council's rights of way officer as being an acceptable uh, width. Um, and at this point here, which aligns with the access into the green where you could continue to get access there. So again, it doesn't change that. Plus the second team pitch there would, would remain open as existing. And so uh, people who have, 
um, a walk across those pitches, that, that route would still be um, enjoyed, I suppose, by, by those people, but on the second team pitch. Brilliant, Mr. Deanson, thank you. Councillor McCusker and Councillor Cusack. Councillor McCusker. Yeah, both Councillor Mullen and Councillor Lancaster have talked about the triangle, but I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I'm struggling to see what, which triangle they're talking about. Were you clear? Did you? Mr. Stevenson. Um, can, I bring, can I see if uh, my colleague Steve David can add some clarity? I believe he was involved in some of the discussions, but I understand it was in relation to health and safety because of an existing spiked fence. Um, Steve, are you available just to talk to that point? Yeah, Mr. Davey, uh, before you speak, would you just introduce who you are and, and, and what your role is in the city? Is that okay? Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. Steve Davey, I'm Planning Policy Officer for City Council. So the comments, I believe, relate to roughly halfway down the pitch on on the um, to the west western side, um, that sort of area there. So there's there's currently some knee rail fencing around the around the pitch, but then beyond that, there's a, there's a line of spiked like old, old spiked iron fencing, um, and there's some office concerns about having that too close uh, to the new fencing. So basically, the, the application was changed to remove that spike fencing and replace it with um, the new palisade fencing instead. Thank you. It's OK. Uh, it's just a quick follow-up. Uh, on, the, uh, on the plan to shows a 1.3 metre fence existing, I'm presuming that's the spiked one. I am, I'm just wondering, I, I, I'm not clear as to um, what the two councillors' concerns are with the triangle. Is it that they would prefer the, the line to follow the pitch back to the clubhouse? It, it just There is a dog like that. I don't think it serves a function as far as the club's concerned, or it's just going to follow the line of the existing 1.3 metre fence. I don't think the club, the club could answer that one, perhaps, more than that. Yeah. Just a quick factual, Mr. Owen. Go on. Bye, That, that's where the equipment, Mr. Owen has just explained the, the space uh, that's in question that Mr. Uh, Stevenson has highlighted is the, uh, is the area where the, uh, the club keeps its uh, uh, equipment to. Yeah, got burned. That's where the new one will go for, for pads around the posts and safety equipment, whatever's needed to play with. So, so that's okay. So, okay, Councillor Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested in this site because uh, I used to spend almost every waking hour as a child playing uh, on this land uh, myself during summer. Uh, in fact, sometimes my parents had to come out and drag me off in order to feed me and get me to bed. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit concerned. Well, first of all, uh, just for information, I'd like to know who owns the land. Is the land owned by Salford City Council? Uh, and, and is it in fact leased to Salford Roosters uh, or not? Uh, but secondly, I'm still a little bit concerned about community access uh, to the land. I, um, I fully understand the massive contribution that Salford Roosters uh, are making in terms of recreation and, uh, and to the sporting community in general. But I wonder whether, uh, and it's a question of the officers again, whether it is... Um, it is reasonable to put a condition on the application as to the hours and times that the gates remain open for local people to use the site when it's not being used for rugby games or training. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cougar. Uh, Councillor Cougar, uh, land ownership is not really a planning matter, as you'll know better than me. Uh, I, I, I understand that, Chair, yeah. but... We usually know who owns the site uh, when we get an application. We don't. He's owned by the Thank you very much. Uh, but, but we won't give it any weight. That, that, is that okay? And then uh, hours of operation. Mr. Stevenson, hours of opening operation. Yes, Chair. Um, I mean, it, it's it's possible. I suppose what we're trying to understand is what what are we what are we providing? I mean, we've heard from the club that their intention is to keep it open at the times when they're there are supposed to supervise it for, for children to use it. The purpose of this recreation land is, is for playing rugby. Um, so I see no issue at all um, subject to, you know, the, the club agreeing to, to agree a set of hours where uh, they will be on site in effect to, to allow access across the fields. But 
Uh, I don't think that would necessarily extend to the club being obliged to allow dog walkers across the pitch. So I think we just need clarity on what public access would be allowing to the pitch during certain hours. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I'm not suggesting that <laughs> by, by any means that uh, dog walkers should be allowed to access the pitch. I'm just suggesting that maybe we should um, um, put a condition on about allowing the local community to use that space. Um, uh, I, I accept absolutely what the club is saying about there being a cafe on it and being the gates open when the cafe is in operation um, and them having some degree of supervision over it. I think that's great. But if commercial considerations come in at some stage in the future where the cafe isn't operable, uh, it is conceivable that that site could be shut off for the majority of the week to the local community. And I'd like to see us um, uh, put a condition on if it is possible to ensure that that site is still open to the local community. Um, and I don't see any reason why they shouldn't prohibit dog owners from w walking on the site either. Thanks, Chair. Get a cab stock, I will bring you in in a second. Uh, Mr. Stevenson, is, is, is there any, anything you could reply with there? Yeah, like I said, I don't have any principal issue with that. I suppose it will be defining that the, you know, a condition may say something along the lines of between certain hours, the uh, first team pitch area will be open and available to members of the public for uh, playing of ball sports, rugby. Yeah, is it something that I could take away and, and, and work with the ward councils on and obviously with the club? Uh, and then because they're not being, that brings what the, the, the community need and what they want with the councillors. Um, I'm entirely, entirely happy with that, Chair, as long as we can go to a, an amicable resolution. Yeah. Uh, and I'd just like to reiterate that, in general, uh, I support the application. No problem. Yes, OK. So, Anthony, uh, 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 I keep picking up work today, but, yeah, 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 but yeah, I'm quite happy to do that. And, 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 and let's have that conversation with the, the ward councillors, uh, with the club and the community. Because, as Councillor Lancaster was saying, there is, is communication... And, uh, and, and celebration of the usage of this site is, is most necessary. And, and so, that, yeah, maybe that, that will form a vehicle that, that brings even more community use. And what you'll find is maybe, maybe it won't even be the club that needs to keep the place open. It would be, there'll be other uses in there, servicing it and keeping it open at the same time uh, for other accessible. So, yeah, I think it's worth it, definitely worth looking at and investigating. So I'm, I'm up for that, Councillor Guzak. So up for that challenge. Thank you. Councillor Clark, not ignoring you yourself. Uh, Phil asked who owned the land. I didn't hear if that was answered. Uh, yeah. yeah, I did answer it, but please don't give it any weight. Pardon? Uh, I did answer it, so please don't give it. It is owned by the City Council, right? Okay. Please don't give that any weight in your decision making. I couldn't, couldn't yeah. Um, right, so this is a public open space. Uh, there we go. Um, fencing off public open spaces. We have a similar facility in Boothstown, Boothstown Football Club, which um, is open 24 hours a day and has suffered from dog fouling, but it has one way in and one way out. And over the past couple of years, we've installed bins and multiple campaigns to get dog owners to pick up their mess. So I think that should be done instead of fencing off a public open space, or you put a lower fence down with a kitten gate like we've got. So there's one way in, one way out with dog bins to collect the mess, but I don't think it's acceptable for the public to be excluded from a public open space because it's their land at the end of the day and people need to be educated to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Thank you so much. Uh, is there any of the members wishing to speak? Councillor Guido. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm... Um, I'm looking at the uh, the site, um, and there seems to be uh, an exactly the same size piece of green beyond this fence, uh, which will be open to the public. Um, I'm not in favour of a fencing off because what does what message is that sending to these young people when they're playing on it? And how are you supposed to stand around and cheer? Because having boys on a rugby pitch, right? Um, they like somebody to actually be cheering them. Uh, along and I don't see any space around here for the for people to stand and cheer when the match is on. Will you have to stand on the other side of the fence? Um, and I just 
The thing that really annoys me more than anything is, I, as, as uh, Councillor Clark has said, I live on the green, as you know, and the number of people that walk the dogs on the green and don't pick it up, I just find it totally unacceptable. This is a health hazard, and I think that we should be doing uh, some sort of campaign in any area where there is this sort of land. Uh, bids are important uh, to actually put there to actually deal with it. But, it. but a lot of us who've got children and they've gone out and they've been playing football or rugby and they come back and their boots are full of it, I tell you what, I'd like it to take it round to the people for them to clear it because it makes me sick having to do other people's mess up, right? And I just find it uh, totally unacceptable. Um, but also I'm a bit concerned about fencing it off. Um, I understand why the club want to do it, and I think it's very laudable that they want to do it, but it is a public space, and that's really difficult. We've had two public spaces today that should be used by communities. And, you know, I'm in sympathy with you because I know what it's like when dogs fouls all over the place, but we should be doing a campaign to actually... Uh, Educate dog owners. I mean, they're not, they're not, not all dog owners are a problem, um, but I think that the uh, vast majority who let their dogs run around uh, don't know where they've pooed anyhow. So they, they can't go and pick it up. So I just, I'm just, I'm really tired on this. I just know why they want to protect it, and I also know that it's a public space and we should actually be keeping it empty, open, right? But Having certain times, and uh, Councillor Cusack said, uh, I let dogs walk on it. Well, that's the reason why we're trying to stop dogs from walking on it, because of them pooing. So if it's going to be open, there's no point in having a fence, is there? I, I don't think Councillor Cusack aims to put dogs back on it after the fence has been put up. I think he wants, the, he wants, the, uh, he wants the, the site accessible for other recreational uses. So, but uh, yeah, uh, behavioural change is humanity's greatest challenge, I agree with you. It really yeah. is. It is. It is. Councillor Hamilton, I will bring you in a second. Uh, Councillor Cruz, did I, did I hear about that you moved the application? Um, uh, no, Chair, but I will. Oh, okay. Right. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hamilton. Yeah, my concern was how um, if I'd been stolen, the equipment pinched and things like that, and that is a real shame, isn't it? That you can't keep anything. It seems you can't keep anything anymore. And that's just a comment. Mm. Well, you've heard from the ward councillors who are, who are, who are, you know, are, 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 for want of a better way, but are, are, are on the grassroots, aren't they? They're right, right on the floor doing, doing the, the bit there. And, and, and they're, they're, asked, they're saying that they've, they've got some concerns, they've weighed it up themselves, uh, they do support it overall, and uh, their concerns are keeping access, even though it's a bit kinked, dog leg, etc. But access is there, but the greenway is undisturbed, which was one of their main key things. So, so I think you've heard from, right from the, from the grassroots there. Councillor McCusker, did you indicate? It was just a second, <coughs> uh, Councillor Cruzat. No problem. Uh, so I've been moving seconded for approval with the extra bit of work for, for me to go away to have a chat with the ward councillors and hopefully with the club and with the community uh, to look at how we can uh, uh, get as much access as possible uh, uh, and, and uh, across what will become actually a dog-free, a dog muck free zone for more sports and activities to take place on. So actually, you know, this should be a, it should be seen as a positive in that way. So, so okay, uh, it's been moved second for approval with my extra work. All in favour of that, please show. Anyone against? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the application has been approved. Thank you so much. Uh, look forward to seeing Mr. Sterling now. Come and visit sometime, Mr. Sterling, to watch a game of rugby. I do appreciate the amateur game more than the professional one, so fabulous stuff. Okay, uh, over to item 5D, members. Mr. Allen. Hi, Chair. Mr. Allen, uh, go forward a slide, please. I can hear you. There you go, that's your, your delay, Mr. Allen. Is that okay? Yeah, and apologies for the connection issues on the, uh, the previous Royal Street item. Hopefully, I think I've got a, a more stable connection to the meeting now. So I'm I, hoping I, you can I, hear me I more clearly. I don't, I don't believe it's your end, Mr. Elliot. I, I believe it's all, all ends. So, so don't, don't panic about it. So, 
it's, a, it's, a, it's an equivalent to a sleepy Monday, I believe. So, um, so over to you yourself. You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, that's great. Thank you, Chair. So the, uh, the application relates to uh, a 0.24 hectare parcel of land on the corner of New Bridge Street and Greengate. And the application seeks full planning permission for the development known as One Heritage Tower, which comprises the erection of a residential-led mixed-use development, including 542 apartments, associated residence facilities and basement parking, together with three commercial units, associated landscaping and public groundworks. The site is bounded by the River Irwell to the northeast, Newbridge Street to the southeast, the highway of Greengate to the southwest, and the presently stored development known as the, Red the Residence to the northwest. The boundary of the city flows the course of the Irwell at this point, and land to the north, including the nearby Tempest Tower, falls within the city of Manchester. Just waiting for the uh, for the slides just to catch up with my system. So the section of land forming the boundary to the Irwell, containing the Riverside Walkway and boundary green on the map on screen, falls within the ownership of the council. And the developer is currently engaged in the process of agreeing a long lease for this section of the site in order to deliver the proposed works for an enhanced riverside walkway and to assume management and maintenance of the new walkway. Members may recall that this scheme was previously considered as a panel meeting in January 2020, of which panel resolved to grant planning permission subject to completion of a Section 106 legal agreement. In the interim period, in light of additional technical design work undertaken by the developer and changing market factors, the applicant has identified a viability gap in the scheme and has therefore sought to make amendments in order to reduce build costs. The Section 106 agreement, although at an advanced stage, has not yet been completed and the formal decision has not yet been issued. As a result, the amendments to the scheme have been submitted for determination under the provisions of the 2019 application and a revised resolution is sought from panel. The revised scheme has been subject to extensive discussions with officers of the LPA in order to ensure that the exceptional design quality of the scheme is preserved and has been subject to a further period of public consultation. No further public representations have been received in response. So for completeness, I'll first run through an overview of the full scheme and then run through the main design changes in comparison to the 2019 scheme, which are for consideration today. So full planning permission is sought for the development of the site with a residential led scheme comprising one building but formed of two distinct but connected volumes. First of these is the lower 14 storey element which sits in the southwest corner of the site and fronts onto Greengate which is known as the shoulder building. Second of the volumes is the 55 storey tower which sits to the northeast corner of the site fronting onto Newbridge Street and the Riverside. The scheme comprises a total of 542 apartments with a mixture of one, two and three bedroom units. And residents' communal spaces throughout the scheme include lounges, bar, gym, terrace, cinema room, library and co-working space. A ground floor are three commercial units, totaling just over 300 square metres in area, intended to be occupied for retail, financial and professional services, restaurant or cafe uses, office space or non-residential community uses. Proposals include for a significant contribution towards delivery of public realm within Greengate, including the replacement and enhancements of the Riverside Walkway, improvements to New Bridge Street, a public route through the development connecting Greengate and the Riverside Walkway, and a £2.5 million contribution towards delivery of public realm, including the proposed market cross area to the south of the site. The site forms a key element of the delivery of the Greengate Regeneration Strategy and sits on the northeastern edge of the area within a context, an emerging context of high rise residential buildings. Southeast of the site is the 31 storey Greengate. Immediately adjacent the site to the northwest is the maximum 35 storey development known as the Residence, and beyond that is the 44 storey Anaconda Cut, formerly known as Exchange Court. Southwest of the site is the 10 storey Abito Complex. 
beyond which sits the site of the 50 storey Collier's Yard scheme, which is currently under construction. As I say, the building is, is comprised of two distinct volumes, each of which ground themselves within separate parts of the site, allowing for the creation of a high quality pedestrian route through the site from Greengate and the proposed market cross public space through to the Riverside walkway. Development also includes provision of three commercial units on critical edges of the site and reinstates lost frontages to Greengate and Newbridge Street. In addition, the generously proportioned entrance foyer and the residence facilities bring additional activity at lower levels. The enhanced riverside walkway on the northern edge of the scheme that would link into the walkway to be delivered as part of the adjacent scheme at the residence. And car parking provision within the basement level is to be accessed by a green gate, while cycle parking within both the basement and at first floor level is to be accessed by a dedicated entrance off New Bridge Street, which provides access to lift facilities. Together with the commercial spaces, additional uses at ground floor level include the residence foyer, concierge desk, management suite, post and parcel stores and the secondary refuse store, which is connected to the main refuse store at basement level to allow for collections from the proposed lay-by on New Bridge Street. And the first floor level is given over to further residence facilities, including the lounge, bar, co-working space, cinema room and library. And the main cycle parking area is provided on the New Bridge Street side of the building. Additional communal facilities are provided at level two, comprising the residence gym and a communal dining space and a common floor layout with a mix of one and two bedroom apartments is used across levels three to 13. A residence terrace is provided at level 14 on the roof of the shoulder building and levels 15 to 46 and 47 to 51 also make use of repeated floor layouts with the former containing a mix of one and two bed units and the latter containing a mix of two and three bed units. Levels 52 to 54 contain five penthouse units, each of which contain three bedrooms and four of which are duplex units. And three of these units benefit from provision of private terrace areas. An additional communal amenity space and terrace area are also provided at level 52 of the tower. Contained within the basement are 24 car parking spaces, together with 70 of the total 178 cycle parking spaces and the main refuse store. Plant space and the surface water attenuation tanks occupy the remainder of the space beneath the building. Turning now to the detail of the facade treatments, the lower shoulder building is proposed to be constructed of facing brickwork in a similar vein to a number of the contemporary buildings within the immediate surrounds. And the architect's vision for the shoulder building is to deliver, to deliver a scheme with a civic quality in order to provide a strong relationship between the scheme and the adjacent forthcoming public realm at Market Cross. The shoulder building facade is comprised of vertically proportioned fenestration, which is set between deeply expressed brick triangular pilasters and precast concrete string courses, which provide strong horizontal lines running across the facade. Metal Juliet balconies will be provided to the windows of living spaces across the building. In contrast, the tower is to be clad with an almost seamless unitised facade, which combines panels of clear glazing, obscure glazing panels fitted with fritted glass, and aluminium purge panels, which feature a decorative motif. The panels are arranged just to create a pleated effect, allowing for animation of the elevations as light conditions change throughout the day, and aluminium string courses run around the building at selected points on the facade to provide horizontal delineation and elements of shadow casting. The top section of the tower will be clad with a unitised facade of similar design to the lower section, except for the flush treatment, and vertical elements or fins project from between the glazing panels to break up the facade and provide a sense of acceleration to the building as it reaches towards its peak. The building is then crowned at the top, the distinctive peaked form, comprising of clear glazing to ensure a distinctive silhouette to the building on the Greengate skyline. The Greengate elevation fronts onto the site of the future market cross and features a dramatic triple height framed entranceway from the public realm through the site to the Riverside walkway 
and the active frontages at this section of the building are comprised of the commercial units and the residence facilities, including that two-storey gym space and the floating bridge connecting the two volumes of the building. Residential units are placed on the southeast corner of the shoulder building at levels 3 to 13, giving the scheme an interface with wider views along Green Gate from the southeast. The new Bridge Street elevation is proposed to front onto an area of improved highway with a narrowed carriageway, provision of a lay-by for deliveries and servicing and a widened footway. Detail of these works is to be agreed through the subsequent Section 278 design process. A dedicated access for cyclists is located on this elevation, allowing for connections into the wider cycle network. And the street frontage at ground level comprises two commercial units at either end with a small area in the centre given over to the necessary servicing entrances. Frontage to the Irwell is comprised of a commercial unit and the building management suite at ground floor, together with the residence lounge, bar and co-working space at first floor, which provide a high level of interaction with that enhanced riverside walkway. The Enhanced Riverside Walkway comprises a key benefit of the scheme, connecting into the walkway to be delivered as part of the adjacent residence scheme, allowing for pedestrian access along the edge of the Irwell. The walkway is to be delivered by the developer under the provisions of the long lease to be agreed with the council, with provision of permissive rights of way to be secured under the Section 106 agreement. The final detailed design of the walkway is to be agreed under the provisions of a planning condition as recommended in the report. The submitted landscape master plan includes detail of the proposed treatment of the areas immediately surrounding the building frontage, together with the treatment of the pedestrian link running through the core of the site and the riverside walkway. This master plan also includes indicative detail of how the scheme may tie into the delivery of the strategic area of public realm at Market Cross. Delivery of Market Cross is not, however, within the applicant's gift, given that it involves third party lands to achieve the realignment of the Greengate Highway. The works may, however, be funded with the open space and public realm contributions secured as part of this application. It's hoped that matters relating to land assembly will have been resolved before construction of the scheme is completed, thus allowing Market Cross to be designed and delivered as a single programme of works. However, in the event that this aspiration is not realised in time, Detail has been provided of an interim landscape scheme for the Greengate frontage, which is to be secured by the Section 278 agreement, which also relates to the new Bridge Street works via an associated planning condition. And the plan on screen there just shows those areas surrounding the site boundary, which are to be subjects of the, uh, the future Section 278 agreement. So I'll just run now through a, a brief summary of the changes in the amended scheme from the scheme which benefited from a resolution to grant planning permission. So the number of dwellings within the scheme has been reduced by three, with some further changes to the mix to increase the number of two bedroom apartments. The building core has also been amended in response to fire safety requirements to provide two fully separate cores running through the centre of the tower, resulting in some associated changes to the internal floor plan. The change to the tower cores has also necessitated a change to the lift over runs and associated plant arrangement to the roof of the tower. These cores now rise slightly further above the highest plant deck level and the louvered screen surrounding the core has been amended to a unitised cladding system still with vertical fins, together with the addition of a larger building management unit. Although the stair and lift cores will be more visible than the crown, they still sit lower than the peak, and the additional visual impact has been tested within an updated townscape and visual impact assessment. And it's not considered that this significantly impacts on the form of the tower within the skyline. The number of basement levels in the scheme has been reduced from three to one, with an associated reduction in parking provision from 64 to 24 spaces, equating to 4.4% provision. A substantial portion of the cycle parking has also been relocated from the basement to level one, and the total number of spaces has risen by two. The provision at 32.8% notably exceeds the 20% minimum standards set out within the UDP. In light of the highly sustainable and accessible location of the site, and given the extensive restrictions by way of traffic regulation orders on surrounding streets, which will deter on street over to parking, the proposed reduced parking level is considered to be acceptable and will assist in driving modal shift. 
In addition, the basement has now been extended underneath the proposed riverside walkway with the inclusion of surface water attenuation tanks as part of the drainage scheme. So as noted, the cycle parking has been partially relocated to level one, and these plans just show how the cycle store benefits from a dedicated access at ground floor level from Newbridge Street, which leads to a lift serving both cycle stores at first floor and basement level. The extended commercial floor space within the scheme has reduced from 512 to 304 square metres due to the removal of mezzanine floor areas, general reconfiguration of the floor plate, and the expansion of the residence gym at level one of the shoulder building. The reduction in commercial floor space is considered acceptable given that the scheme retains active uses to key frontages. The shoulder building was originally proposed to be faced with a precast concrete facade with a stone-like appearance. The original intent was for large sections of this precast facade to be made and glazed off site. However, the resultant weight of the panels, limitations on glazing types which could be used, and the need for a complex delivery and construction set up on site presented a significant logistical and cost constraint to the development. The developer has therefore considered alternative options and proposes to use hand laid traditional cavity brick construction together with precast feature string courses and triangular pilasters in order to ensure that the building retains the necessary visual quality and civic design feel fronting onto the new area of public realm. The design in the shoulder building fronting onto Market Cross, previously also included for the provision of sheltered balconies on the corner. The developer has undertaken further analysis of the technical feasibility of constructing these features, in particular in relation to the structural composition of the supporting column. And in the absence of using inferior cladding materials of different appearance to the main elevation, it determined that the design intent could not be achieved. It's considered that the shoulder building nonetheless still retains a very strong presence onto the future market cross and green gate, with the window arrangements providing for a visible sense of activity and those mid-range views along green gate. The roof terrace on top of the shoulder building previously included an extruded continuation of the pilasters to create a partially open framework surrounding the immediate area. In order to comply with enhanced building regulations requirements, the developer is no longer able to use a glass balustrade in this location and the extended pilaster grid could not be constructed in traditional hand laid brick. At roof level, it's therefore now proposed that the shoulder building terminates with a brick corbel detail which is more reminiscent of large 20th century neoclassical masonry buildings, which provides a grand cornice to finish the elevation. It's considered that the new parapet treatment would align with the redesigned shoulder building facade and does not diminish the overall design quality of the building. Finally, the projecting fins, which are located across the unitized facade on the upper section of the tower, and which are also located on parts of the base section, have been reduced in total number by a third. The clarity of the top of the tower and the visual difference between the main body and the crown area remains strong and it's not considered that the reduction in the number of fins has a substantive impact on the design quality of the tower such that it detracts from the overall quality of the scheme. Planning obligations recommended to be secured within a section 106 legal agreement remain in accordance with the principles agreed at the point of previously resolving to grant planning permission for the scheme Although the initial contribution figure has been updated to reflect the change to the housing mix and to reflect the, the uplift to the Council's contribution formula for open space contributions in the interim period. It's therefore recommended that a financial contribution of £2.49 million is secured towards the provision and improvement of open space and public realm within Greengate in order to contribute towards the strategic vision set out by the Council within the Greengate Regeneration Strategy and in order to ensure an appropriate street level setting for a tall building on the site. It remains the recommendation that a clawback mechanism is included within the Section 106 agreement to secure a further contribution from the applicant up to the maximum contribution identified should the viability of the development increase in the future, with any clawback monies to be directed towards the provision of off-site affordable housing. In addition, it remains the recommendation that the legal agreement secure the provision of the new public route through the centre of the site, and provision and access to the improved Riverside Walkway. In summary, the scheme comprises the redevelopment of the historically inefficiently used area of previously developed land, 
to deliver 542 new homes in a highly sustainable location within a building of exceptional design and quality. Development also delivers additional commercial floor space at street level to provide amenities for the emerging residential population within Greengate in accordance with the Council's aspirations set out in the Greengate Regeneration Strategy and also includes for the provision of high quality public realm in the form of the improved Riverside Walkway, improvements to Newbridge Street and delivery of the connecting route from Market Cross to the Irwell. In addition, the scheme will deliver a significant financial contribution of £2.5 million to be directed towards the delivery of strategic public realm. Development is considered on balance to give rise to acceptable impacts on the amenity and living conditions enjoyed by existing neighbouring residents and will provide a good quality environment for future residents. In addition, the scheme would not give rise to unacceptable residual cumulative impacts on the surrounding highway network and development would not unacceptably harm the significance of any designated heritage assets when taking into account the public benefits arising from the scheme. Acceptable strategies for preventing unacceptable adverse impacts from the development in relation to construction impacts, biodiversity, potential archaeological interest, drainage, land contamination, and air traffic control radar are to be secured by way of recommended conditions. And officers considered that the revised scheme would achieve all 10 characteristics of a well-designed place as set out within the National Design Guide, and considered that the proposals represent a sustainable form of development which complies with the relevant policies of the development plan the MPPF and the Council's Greengate Regeneration Strategy. Revised application is therefore recommended for approval in accordance with the previous resolution of the panel, subject to the conditions and planning obligations as set out at page 94 of the agenda report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Allen. I do believe our Mr Upton wishes to speak from the applicants and applicants' agents side. Is that the case? Mr Upton? Uh, do you need five minutes, Mr. Upton? Is, is that okay? Absolutely. Fabulous. Welcome. Over to yourself when you get going, and I'll give you a shout after four minutes. Thanks. Okay. So, thank you very much indeed, Chair. Um, my name is Jason Upton, the Chief Executive Officer at One Heritage. Uh, key members of our project team are also here uh, today, including Ewan Kelly from Ewan Kelly Property Solutions and Nick Berry from uh, My Architects, should you have any specific questions in relation to the scheme. Firstly, just wanted to extend my thanks to yourselves and also your officers for giving us the opportunity to submit our revised proposals and also for taking the time to hear our, our application again at planning committee. Since the panel resolved to grant planning permission for our proposals in January last year, we've worked tirelessly with the design team and a number of potential contractors to constantly refine the scheme to ensure it remains viable and economically deliverable. Um, in what's been a very challenging 18 months. Thanks to the support of your officers, we're proud to be in a position where, subject to your approval today, we can enter a pre-construction services agreement with the contractor Midgard and all being well start on site in the coming weeks. The changes we propose to the scheme, all of which are presented in your officers' report, are relatively minor in nature. However, cumulatively, they'll put us in a position where the scheme is economically viable. Notwithstanding these changes, the scheme will still be of exceptional architectural quality and will make a significant contribution to the continued growth and transformation of Greengate by attracting new residents and introducing active frontages, high quality public realm and pedestrian routes. Alongside the continued engagement with, with your officers, we also ensured the local community had been notified of the scheme changes. In June, a letter drop was delivered to around 660 properties with, within the uh, sorry. Greengate Regeneration Area and residents within the nearby Tempest Tower. No concerns were raised as part of this engagement or during the determination of our revised proposals. In addition, to support the revised proposals, our appointed technical consultants have all revisited the studies they prepared to support the original application. This has included a submission of an updated environmental assessment to ensure the impact of the revised development has been appropriately assessed and, where necessary, mitigated. These assessments have concluded that the scheme is in full accordance with the relevant local and national planning policy and there's no technical constraint we cannot be overcome to enable residential development in this location. To conclude, we remain committed to the delivery of this hugely exciting project, which will make a significant contribution to the regeneration objectives outlined in the latest re uh, Green Gate Regeneration Strategy. And thank you again for your time this afternoon. We hope you're able to support your officer's recommendation. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I don't have any ward members who registered to speak. Okay, members, we had a very healthy debate about this application back in January of, uh, of last year. Uh, there's been no planning policy change within the city. Uh, there's been small changes within inside the building envelope. We've got better materials from the previous one, and uh, we've got more increased two beds uh, and less one beds. Uh, is anyone willing to move the application for approval? Councillor Cusack. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'd, I'd like to um, move approval of this. I think it's a significant contribution to the um, street scene in Salford. I, um, I was worried, I have to admit, about the design. The presentation, uh, to some extent, has satisfied me about the design, but I do think in future, uh, if we're looking at the building of this magnitude, uh, and this impact um, in, the, in, in an urban setting, then I think we probably need more design information with the, um, with, with the report. Uh, it's difficult to, um, to, to get a decent, a, a decent analysis of design from CGIs that you're looking at from 25 feet away. Um, it, it'd be much more useful to me, personally, as a member of this panel, if some of the CGIs were included in the report in the first place. But generally, um, it looks like a good design. It looks like a contribution to the street scene. And um, I understand um, the objections to it, but I think a contribution to the regeneration of Salford and its establishment as, a, uh, as, as the kind of city we now know it to be um, trumps those uh, reservations, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cruz. Uh, Councillor Cruz, it's a bit of a miss of me, really, because when this originally came to panel, there was a briefing uh, from the officers to give you that ability to see the design as it either came into the system or pre outside of it. Uh, and it's, you know, it's just an officer briefing to give you that uh, information. And, you know, late this month, there'll be that for some of the applications that are coming in. And this was done, and it should have, I should have, it's missed for me, I should have redone it for members who are new to the panel. Uh, I'll make sure anything else that's in the system that's been briefed on that comes back for any changes get re briefed to new members is that okay? It's missing me. Councillor McCusker, see your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to second um, Councillor Kuzak and just say, um, you know, as, as you said, this is an improvement on, on the original one, which we already passed. Um, Councillor Garrido's concerns about um, too many one bedrooms, that there's been a, a, that's been addressed in, in, in part uh, through increasing the numbers of two bedrooms in the scheme. So, yeah, I think this will be a you know, significant building on our skyline, looking over to Manchester. Um, and I therefore second the proposal to accept. Uh, Councillor Guido? Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, and uh, as Councillor Cusker says, I'm delighted to see that that's all of it. Um, just on a, um, one thing that um, I, I've I missed, I've missed it in the other ones as well. Will there be any electric charging points on these car parking? Because we are in trying to encourage uh, everybody to, uh, to go for electric cars or hybrid cars or whatever they're called. Um, so I just wondered whether there will be any um, charging points on here, which, which may help. And just one little thing, uh, has, has anybody spoken to ex-Councillor Antrobus? Uh, <laughs> because the, the cross has been his, I was gonna say the cross has been his cross, right? So, um, um, I hope he's pleased with us that we've actually uh, uh, gone a long way to, I think, helping uh, with the, uh, the sighting of the cross. He, he's still about... The market right cross, I can assure you of that. Uh, the EV charging, you'll remember from January last year, we had a really good debate about it. Uh, and uh, uh, we had our cycle champion on the, on the panel at the time. And we managed, to, we managed to get condition done for EV charging, not just for cars, but for cycling as well. Uh, and I believe it's condition 27. I'm being reliably informed. Yeah. Is, is that okay? Would you like us to read it out? Chair, yeah, I'll open recommendation that uh, condition 27 is obviously asking for EV charging points to be secured within that parking area. Okay. Uh, to the maximum we can within our UDP, because yes. our, our local private, I, I can't see how a, uh, a, an operator wouldn't want to put it for every space. 
given that the, the level of demand and, and, and that's, that's, that's what's going to drive it. So, I mean, that's what's going to happen. It's okay. Councillor Clark, and then I'll be moving say I'll move to the vote. Okay. Just two things. One thing, at least it's not square, but unfortunately, it's yet another blot on the landscape. Okay, thank you, Councillor Clark. Okay, members, uh, Councillor Trezor. Right. Um, just 542 flats and 24 car parking spaces. Is it worth having a car park at all? If it, I mean, certain future developments have been agreed with zero car parking spaces at all. I mean, it's, would, should the council be thinking about making that whole region a car-free zone? Uh, are we, uh, is it, I, I mean, Greengate, we have, and, and I, I, I wholeheartedly encourage it for, for Greengate because it's, it's such an accessible space in place. And as you'll see, many from the angle that you're looking at, a lot, a lot of those developers out there are quite happily function perfectly fine. Uh, and we don't have any Austrian car park issues at that level, uh, so yeah, it's worked perfectly fine. So it's a it's a it's a question for 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 yeah, uh, but, but yeah, I'm wishing all the way. Uh, members, could I ask that uh, that, that you uh, oh, delegate to the chair uh, the landscaping and walkway condition, because I think that does need some political oversight and community oversight, and also the materials. We need to we start with well with materials in this bit of the city. We need to keep that bar up. Uh, and uh, I think the one six, and then and, and some involvement in the section two seven eight, but I do realise there's a lot of legislation in that as well. So just alongside that, if you could delegate that to the chair in consultation with officers, we'd be so great. Okay, members, it's moved, moved and seconded for approval with those said extra bits of conditions. Uh, all in favour of that, please show. Okay, anyone against? And any abstentions? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's been, been approved. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your attendance. Okay, members, we've had, we're going to move straight on to, well, are you happy to approve the delegated items report, item six? Approved. Oh, Councillor Guido. Uh, can I just uh, raise a point? Um, Worsley now is in with Westwood Park. Yeah. This hasn't altered yet, so I'm having to look, for, well, I do, I, I do look through Eccles and uh, Worsley. And also, Row Green is now in with Booth Town and Ellenbrook. Um, so I think that uh, that probably needs to be We've, uh, looked at as well. And I don't know whether anybody else has got any problems. Well, let's, let's iron that out because I can see things are starting to change, but I don't know how far they've changed because Mr. Hodgson and Mr. Stevenson have been working to yeah, no, get that's this all ironed out. Sort of is it a legacy issue? Yes, Chair. Like, I mean, obviously. It obviously got changed from a, a certain period. Okay, so councillor. Obviously, councillors know. Um, obviously, we, we could. If, if it's obviously a, a matter for, for panel members, I mean, we can spend resource going back correcting this. I don't think councillor is asking me to do that, but that, that's what it involved, Chair. Is that okay? That's not what I'm asking for. I'm just saying that, yeah. uh, that you know, because this actually ties up with uh, looking at our planning policies that come out. Yep. You know, planning applications that are sent out to us as well uh, for us to check. So I'm just just making sure that we're, we're on board with that. Thank yeah. you. I'll never ask you to feel sorry for me, but I'll get all you know, my word changed. Thank you. Asked it, so. <laughs> okay, happy. Everyone's happy with that. Okay, final appeals. Now, I know you guys are waiting in anticipation for the enforcement and appeals DVD of Sovereign City Council to be released. Uh, and we do actually have uh, a case here as a bit of a teaser for you. As a, as a, and Mr. Stevenson is going to present this little teaser before the DVD is released. Mr. Stevenson, item seven, the, uh, the enforcement that we took. Is this the, the gyro site, Chair? It is indeed, Mr. Stevenson. Uh, you could have yeah, so a bit more of a jingle to it or something, couldn't you? Know, of, of, so. Oh, yeah, so you. this... Um, Obviously, you can see from the report that this relates to um, what was an existing car wash site and a mobile catering unit was sited on there selling um, hot food. It was brought to our attention on the 24th of December last year, day before Christmas, um, and through the actions of our enforcement team, a planning application was submitted to retain it there in February. Um, that was determined and refused in April and immediately followed up with a planning enforcement notice. The applicant, as is their right, appealed both the planning application decision and the enforcement decision. Um, the case officer um, and enforcement officer put together a very comprehensive and strong case as to, to why this should be removed. 
Um, I think in, on reading that, the applicant then decided to withdraw their appeal uh, and therefore we've still got the enforcement notice which needs to be complied with. The majority of it has been complied with. Um, following a site visit just this morning, I understand the only matter now remaining is the white storage building, uh, which has been relocated to another part of the site, but is still on there. So we're going to follow up with the applicant and get that removed. And the environmental health are also involved because there have been reports of food prep continuing to take place from there. So it's, it's nearing completion, Chair, but uh, not quite yet. Please send our regards to the great work done on, on that. Uh, Councillor Guido. Yeah, um, I think we also should um, recognise um, the work and the notifications and photographs and everything that the local residents actually put in. Mm. Um, I mean, they worked very hard as residents to actually um, collate all the, the photographs and what was happening. Yeah. And... Um, uh, were on top of it all the time and I know that uh, Sam was very keen, that's the enforcement officer, uh, to actually hear from them so I'd like to, based on my record, let my our thanks I think to the residents who actually fought it really well. Thank you Councillor Greeno, I mean without that evidence we're dead in the water really aren't we so you know, we have great stuff. Okay, is everyone happy to adopt uh, the plan of appeals report? Is that okay? There are no items of any of the business, there's no part two. So thank you ever so much for watching, if you are still watching. And uh, Mr. Williams, would you please uh, uh, end the live stream? Thank you so much.